what's it like playing uh, at that level? You know, you ended up making it to the pros mm -hmm. as well. Like, what's it like playing, uh, you know, uh, having um, everything kind of on your shoulders as a quarterback? Uh, it's, you know, it's it's a good stress. It's a position where you learn, you learn a lot about life. Why do you think you're so passionate about it? I think what burns the desire is I spent from 2010, that was really the moment where I was like, something's up with my movement and I need answers to, the, to what's up because whatever it is, it's gonna keep me from being on the roster. As a football player, the alluring aspect of putting 500 pounds on your back, even though it might not be the best for you, it's like, it's something that they're gonna it's gravitate into to. The culture. It's culture. It's into the culture. It's into the culture. Yeah. You can work hard at the wrong things, like you said, and you could destroy yourself. You just explained it so uh, well to Brad about how to stand. And mm -hmm. I just thought, I, I, I've heard you guys say a lot of things, but I haven't heard it. Uh, really broken down that way and it just seems so simple yeah i mean the first thing is how far away are your feet from each other so when kids are coming to you guys you probably have dealt with hundreds of kids who have been given orthotics mm -hmm. specifically for sport or have been told they're flat-footed what is the prime reason that you see that's the problem there my son had this little water bike i called it <laughs> it didn't have pedals so you had to use your feet to push yourself yeah. and he would just push inside uh, edge water bike. i seen him ride it it was like a christmas gift too <laughs> He went to bed, I picked it up and threw it in the garbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, took my bike. Brand new bike away. Yeah. I'm like, hell yeah, I threw it away. His foot's pointed outward, yeah, therefore gonna, a lot yeah, of the energy is going to be gonna pushing that way. It's going to suffocate the ankle. In junior high school, like on the basketball team, kids will be rolling their ankles all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. When I see the way like, you know, being on the outside and then cutting, making cuts, mm -hmm. but nobody seems to be rolling, why, what's preventing that from happening? It's a great question. Cal Dietz has done this in a way, and I know we talked about him earlier, he just doesn't have his athletes do things with their heels on the ground. You look at the knee, it's still pointing straight. We want the kneecap to point out. We want to feed the we want to feed the rotary aspect of the ball and sockets. Mm -hmm. Like we just want to pay homage to how those 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 cats need to move. It's the 90%. Mm -hmm. I mean, people talk about getting better and, and you know conquer the day and I'm super folk. What about the 90%? You know, no matter what you do, the training's always gonna fall on that 10%. Mm -hmm. There's always gonna be way more time that you're spending in your walk and your resting world. Listen, him, naughty, even whack. Like, he, like all of these people were trying to find a better way, not just to make, not not from a business side, but I think the initial reaction to everything is, is there's gotta be a better way. First off, thank you guys for illuminating all of this and helping me to be able to kind of understand the reasoning behind all you do. It's, it's, it's really, it's really dope. It's really dope. Um, and I know that I think I had some assumptions on what it was all about, uh, but you know, seeing how it's based, it's really fucking cool. So I appreciate it. Power Project family, how's it going? This episode is brought to you by Vivo Barefoot Shoes. Now, we've been wearing Vivos for almost a year now, but the great thing about Vivos, unlike normal shoes, where you put your foot into these casts that aren't mobile, they have a small toe box, and they're, they're very dense, is that you're putting your foot into a cast. You're weakening your feet. You don't feel the ground in normal shoes. The great thing about Vivos is they're extremely flexible. They have a wide toe box. They are made to help strengthen your feet. One thing I want to mention here is that when you grab some Vivos, you may tell yourself, these are uncomfortable or these hurt. That's because your feet are weak. And as you wear these shoes, they'll start to get stronger. They'll start to feel the ground. They're good for the health of your feet. Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. So me personally, I, it took me about two weeks to really be able to be like, okay, I think I'm getting it. Now I do not wear any other type of shoes. I only wear Vivo barefoot shoes. You guys have to do this for your feet. You guys got to head over to vivobarefoot.com slash power project. When you guys go there, you'll see a backstory on why we love these shoes so much. But when you're ready to purchase, make sure you guys use promo code power project 20 to save 20% off links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Skinny guys. Hey, you want me to send you some Skinny of that foot neck picture? <laughs> Which ones? The ones that, um... Oh, yeah, we're gonna... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is Ricky even in the shot? Am I here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, you're, good. Like, his you're, nose. Good, you're good, you're good, you're <laughs> good. Can you hear me? We went ultra <clears throat> wide angle, though. Check, check. Yeah, I might have... I'm kind of loud, so... No, that's good. Why is he so tall? He's very tall. I'm just trying to stay back chain. Or, 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 <laughs> or why are we so short? Why are we so short? I am so you're short. You're like 5'7", I'm like 5'9". Ricky, you're six one, right? Yeah, yeah, six yeah. one. <laughs> six one and a half. <laughs> six one and a half and shrinking. Keep my nose at this thing right here the yeah. whole time. Uh, the fullback from the uh, Seahawks, Bellflower, Bellflower, Belor, Nick Belor, yeah. yeah, yeah, Nick Belor. He said to say what's up. Oh man, legend.
Yeah, I love he Bourne. was. Uh, I don't. Know, he and I were just like texting back and forth. Yeah. And he's like, "You're hanging out with Ricky." He's like, "That's my boy." This <laughs> yeah. was like the first time that you came around. And uh, just because I know, like, the locker room talk, I was like, he's a skinny bitch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he said the same shit. Yeah. He's yeah. Like, okay, is yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it, it gets even better. Like, when we went out there by Kittle, Kittle's sister, Emma, who's a beautiful girl, she goes, Oh, when I got to Iowa, Ricky Stanzi was a god. At that oh, point. Yeah. <laughs> he was a right, so you're causing yeah, trouble there. Little, <laughs> not true. And it wasn't just because another of the guy through the football. He just started three years as a quarterback. They were probably following him around like them little ducks. Follow somebody. <laughs> what, what state he was, was Tim this? Tebow, Iowa. Uh, Iowa? He, yeah, he was you're Tom Iowa, Brady of Cleveland. You're in Iowa 10. There's just not a lot going on <laughs> out there. You know? yeah. It's just corn and football. 15 <laughs> years from now? 15 years from now, you're going to go down to Iowa. You're going to see some six foot four kid walking around fall all go to and shit. <laughs> you can have a Stanzi right, jersey on you. Right. <laughs> right. Oh, fair warning because y'all probably smell it. It's me. I smell. I, I worked out this morning. I smell bad. So I don't smell nothing. You guys I told you we, we got it taken on, care of. We got it sure. taken care of. We're I good. I smell horrible right now. <laughs> no, you're good. I'm not noticing anything. I don't, I don't got nothing. When you do notice it, understand it's yeah. me and just keep the conversation right. going. Just don't say flowing. anything about it. Maybe it's just because it, I have an overwhelming smell of my own balls going on. You know, <laughs> I, I can't smell you through that. I don't know. Because we have our their own, own stench going on and it's masking each other. So. Yeah, yeah. Because mm. I, I ran. the dude wipes work. Dude. Yeah. Shit. Oh, told you. you use a dude wipe. He gave me a dude wipe and I just like. Specifically. He, <laughs> he's the one who told me I smell like I, shit. I had, I had to do the thing. <laughs> we're we're going to record some other stuff and I'm like, like. I, you got to take the dude wipes. He's like, what? I was like, you got to go take this dude wipe, go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. take a shower. If he smells you from there, though, you might want to. You're distracting me. I also yeah. have it was, some pretty I good worked sniffers. out, man. I didn't come in smelling like that. But yeah. the thing is, it's like you didn't like, like you came in early. You were doing all kinds of shit and getting super sweaty. And then we recorded. Then you yeah. went back out there and you, we like, we were in the gym all day today. It wasn't just like, oh, workout. You just didn't stop. <laughs> Once you get sweaty twice like that, that's You're when fucked. all hell breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like remember uh, <laughs> two a days in football, <sighs> how bad the pads get. My daughter the other day was asking me about like, She's like, can you wash your football pads? Like when you played football, can you? I was like, nothing gets washed yeah, hardly. It's bad. Just I was like, in the it's locker room. It's awful. There's so much school. bacteria and the bullshit on there. Stuff, you <laughs> couldn't strip it down either. I think some of that new school stuff, like you could kind of take it apart a little bit. But oh, at least college, you it's have kind of like the car seat, seat. like your kids' car seat. Like oh, you just yeah. don't ever get clean. No. Yeah. <laughs> you, take that thing, you go upside down with that outside the car and just yeah, shake it out. Skittles and money and all that stuff. And shit. Literal shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> shit and milk. I always said, like, who's the motherfucker that said, don't cry over spilled milk? Yo, they never had a kid. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. If someone spills milk in your car, you you got to throw away it's your whole car. The car's got to go. Oh, my God. There's they, no had way. That, they had that meme where the baby, like, the diaper bust and the shit was all down oh. the leg. And, the, and the, the meme was like, just throw the baby away. Yeah. <laughs> Start over. Sometimes that's what happens, right, Andrew? Well... <laughs> No, yeah, absolutely. So, like, my thing though is like with the uh, the like the, the the high chair that we feed them in. Uh oh, it's like no, it, it, it's, it's also thing. not designed to be washed. Like I, my dumb <laughs> ass, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna take care of it. Like this is this is all bad. And so, like, I'm like taking it apart. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like I broke it. Like now these are meant to be taken apart. And they come to find out, you're not supposed to take them apart. Mm. So I yeah. I I've, get the I've, hose. I've you know what you do? Feed them in the sink. Hose it down. Feed them in the sink. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just take the little thing out and squirt them all off. Yeah. Listen, I got five kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, he does get to the bidet now. That's the other thing. Is he'll oh, turn, nice. he'll click that shit on, and then just like his oh, water oh, spewing that's everywhere. That's no, it's bad because it just goes over his head. <laughs> mm. We were talking a little bit before we got on, and we were talking about. Uh, eating, you know, and how some of the guys mm -hmm. and some of the kids that you guys are training, the teenage athletes, how they should eat uh, to like get big and stuff like that. That obviously must have been a huge hurdle for you when you were young growing yeah. up and being so dang tall, right? Yeah, I was probably doing protein shakes since the age of 10. I remember I'd finished dinner. And my dad would just slide over the protein shake just after mm -hmm. I'd finished like steak and potatoes. And that carried all the way through college. I mean, I walked into Iowa at like 198 at one point i was like 236 235 mm. and now i'm probably back down to 198 Whoa. and it yeah so i had to hold a bunch of weight you know and it was i set alarms in the middle of the night mm. to drink protein shakes i woke up early to have first breakfast then had second breakfast <laughs> first lunch second lunch and so it's just a lot of meals and it was discipline once mm. i was done with ball i was like I was fasting naturally. Mm. So I just didn't want to eat anymore. Mm -hmm. I was right. like, dude, I don't, it's not, I'm not even eating breakfast. I'll push this thing till one or two and then I'll eat then. 
were that's you, kind of what I've been doing. Were you a better player for it? Like, uh, were you better when you got bigger? Um, there was definitely some some strength increase, definitely with like the ball, the velocity of the ball, mm. being able to step on it. Um, but then once the mechanics started to go, the size couldn't catch up with that. It was harder for you to throw the yeah. ball the way that you used to. Right. And so there was kind of like a little moment there where it jumped and then it kind of started to regress a little bit. And I kind of started to fluctuate my weight. At one point, like I said, I was about 235. Then I played like 215. Then I was kind of like 210, 215 fluctuating around there for mm. a while. What's it like playing uh, at that level? You know, you ended up making it to the pros mm -hmm. as well. Like, what's it like playing, uh, you know, uh, having um, everything kind of on your shoulders as a quarterback? Uh, it's, you know, it's it's a good stress. I think um, it's a position where you learn you learn a lot about life. You know, you're in college and my job, like I felt like I had a job and it was playing, you know, college quarterback. I mean, every single day you're in the film room from the morning till nighttime and you're dialing in all the different schemes, and you not only have to know your job, you got to know everybody else You're a around student, you. A student yeah. athlete, though. It, well, there was, you know, <laughs> there was there was school. I was there. Like, hey, how are you? Yeah, yeah, I got to go watch film. Um, no, I got, you know, I'm a C's get degrees kind of guy, but <laughs> don't listen to that, kids. But no, I, I my sort of my, um, you know, people are like what would you major in in college? I'm like football. You know, I mean, I watched a lot of tape, and and there was a lot of study that went into it. But um, I've always loved that part of football. For young people, whether you go to the pros or not, it teaches you daily discipline. You know, the game demands your attention. It demands your respect. And it could be said about almost any sport. You have to put that time in. And that's why sport parallels so well to life because you learn kind of how to control yourself, control your emotions, control your mind, control your work habits. Um, and yeah, I'll always kind of remember that part of the game of football. And I'll always remember the camaraderie too mm. with your boys and that those two things always kind of ring true more than even the fun wins you know and it, i think that that part of it is what i tried i had the you know the fortunate um opportunity to help coach football back in my high school and so going back now mm. and just like i'm like how many things do i want to tell these kids that i didn't know and it usually comes back to like being a good teammate being disciplined with your work ethic and just being a good person mm. before you're even even touching on x's and o's and uh, what about injuries? Was that something that you ran into a lot of? Yeah, I had. I was able to stay away from the concussion bug a little bit, which was good. I had two of those, um, and I had third degree AC separation here. How? Um, I got. It was actually an off season drill. I was there was no pads. You're doing like a special teams, like chase the rabbit, and I tried to run around a corner, and I was the rabbit, and I got pushed from behind, and I just rolled on my shoulder and just. Third degree. Mm. They're like, we see this in like motorcycle accidents. So I completely wow. blew that out, which was my throwing shoulder, which was a tough, it was a tough rehab. I'll be honest. And but then, you did manage to rehab it and keep yeah, playing. Yeah. And That's it had, amazing. you know, it clicked and it had some things, but I was able to get the throwing <laughs> motion back. And um, then, you know, I had, I had a left uh, MCL that took a shot, uh, was able to play through that. And then I, my right ankle was kind of the big injury my junior year um, that it was near the end of the season. And I missed two games at the end. I had to have surgery. So I went, it was a Saturday afternoon. I uh, got caught inside ankle bone low and uh, somebody fell on it. And that kind of blew the ankle ligaments. And I had to get uh, tightrope surgery right in there. And that was my, my bigger injury. Um, and it never really gave me too many problems, but it started, funny enough, it started to resonate in the knee when I got to the NFL. You know, I started to, um, when I was running in the NFL, I was doing a little bit of scout team wide receiver. So mm -hmm. I hadn't been running. <laughs> And now I'm running scout team wide receiver for a week. And within a week, my right knee, I'm like, dude, something's wrong with my right knee. Like, this thing's feeling like it's going to blow. And then fast forward to go down, I started watching the tape. And I'm like, I was super inside ankle bone low from that injury. Mm. And so that was a good one for me to kind of like put it together of that pattern with the foot being crooked and the inside ankle bone being low. I'm like, well, I got injured there. And I never really kind of got that inside ankle bone high again. And then I started to chew on the knee. And so as I was going through pro ball, I was – I was a third stringer. I was on the I was on the bench. I was on the edge of the roster, um, and I was noticing myself having more chronic type stuff. Mm. You know, like the back was always giving me spasms from when I was young, but I was having my left hip just bark at me, and I was like, I'm not even playing. Like I can't imagine how these guys actually playing mm. feel. Yeah. I'm falling apart. What's going on? That question kept pushing me towards an answer, something to get me out of chronic pain. That was when I found these guys, and after watching myself run, I'm like, oh well. That explains your left hip. That explains your right knee. That explains your back. That explains your shoulder. So I was able to get some confirmation, and that helped. And then being in slow motion, 
like I said, being a QB, that's the world. You're mm-hmm. watching slow motion video all the time. So it just, those two worlds merge really well for me. The first time you came in here, you came in here guns blazing. <laughs> you went into our conference room and just started talking and you started showing us all these diagrams and Gary's chiming in. You guys are going back and forth and it was really cool. And you guys just like blitzed us and just slammed us with information all the way to the point where uh, we didn't really have any questions anymore because yeah, right. you guys just, you, you gave you gave us uh, so much information. And then this time around, you kind of did the same thing. You were given in SEMA a lot of mm-hmm. information. There were some other people in there, uh, Graham Tuttle, the barefoot sprinter, mm-hmm. and you're just smashing us with information. Why do you think you're so passionate about it? Do you think because you feel like uh, like with this information, uh, you could have just had a lot more opportunity in, in your time playing football? Um, I, I mean, I don't like to go back and play the, the what if game. I just feel like as a um, as a the, the now moving into the older generation or looking back on the, the, the young kids, we've got to give the information back better. That's always been my thing. Like I now know <clears throat> what I didn't know and I want to rush to tell somebody else. <clears throat> and so that I think what burns the desire is I spent from 2010, that was really the moment where I was like, something's up with my movement. And I need answers to the, to what's up because whatever it is, it's going to keep me from being on the roster. And so I knew that. And then the NFL was a, was a struggle for me. I'll be honest. I wasn't um, having success. I was struggling at the game. I wasn't able to throw the ball the way I wanted to. And so when I was going through that, I was slowly looking more and more into movement. And I was studying the Eastern arts just as well as I was studying the Western. I mean, I was looking at Kelly's threat stuff. I was looking at gymnastics training and strict strict strength type training. And um, I was looking at the Eastern arts like Shaolin monks and, and Tai Chi and Kung Fu. And I was looking into pranayama. I was just looking for answers. And so that search for answers really created a passion for movement and just understanding how the body worked. And it just kept going and going. And then once I found these guys and I had the slow motion video and I could just look at it and I could curate and I could look at all these different injuries and I could explain it better with the video. It was kind of like, well, we've got to let everybody know it. And that's really where the passion comes from is I'm learning from all my past mistakes or things that I didn't do right. And now there's a bunch of kids that are coming up and they're 15, 16 years old and they need those answers. You know, they, they, they deserve those answers and we deserve to give it back to them better. And that's kind of where I think the passion starts. Yeah, I think it is really cool because like even when I was playing soccer, there was not that much information like YouTube really wasn't mm-hmm. around. Mm-hmm. All this information wasn't easily accessible in terms of like good ways to move, even ways to actually handle yourself in a weight room. Because looking at all the things that we do and contextually, I want to actually uh, uh, set this up within context because there are power lifters that listen. There are bodybuilders that listen. With everything that we talk about, we talked, but we're talking about it in the context of field athletes or athletes that are doing locomotive, mm-hmm. locomotive type stuff. Soccer yeah. players, football players, basketball players, baseball players. This isn't powerlifting. This isn't bodybuilding, right? Correct. So as we, if you guys were talking to me about a lot of stuff, I was like, damn, like if I if I knew some of this when I was an athlete. I wouldn't have gone so hard on certain things when I was playing soccer. It doesn't make sense for me to be doing high loaded back squats as a soccer player. Mm -hmm. I also wish I knew stuff in terms of my feet too, but the information I think that you guys have, and a lot of some of these other guys too have, it's gonna be really great to see some of these new athletes develop understanding what they should be trying to focus on and maybe what they should stay away from Mm -hmm. because the alluring thing, and I, I, it's kind of alluring as, as a soccer player to be in the weight room, but as a football player, the alluring aspect of putting 500 pounds on your back, even though it might not be the best for you, it's like it's something that they're gonna it's gravitate to. Culture. Culture. Etched into the culture. Etched into the culture. Yeah. It's you know you see the you see the the YouTube videos, you see the Instagram videos, the the you know, the, the Twitter videos or TikTok where the whole football teams gather around one rack yeah. and everybody's juiced up. Like that's the culture that's worked its way into the football arena. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's spot on where it's, it's work hard, but you got to work smart. You know, you don't have that much time in your day. And so my big thing with, with young athletes and what I try to, you know, stress to parents is don't waste your time. Like you only have so many hours in a day. These kids are already pressed with school. They're already pressed with travel sports and all these other things that they're doing that you need to be direct with your information for these kids and for these parents. And so that's why I kind of try to have sort of a sense of urgency when I'm talking to somebody. And it's, I want to almost give them a day one install vibe and throw a bunch of shit at them. Even if they don't retain all of it, it's floating around somewhere in there. Mm. And it's all kind of aimed at 
work hard, but also work smart because you can work hard at the wrong things, like you said, and you could destroy yourself. Mm. I've seen some guys that they walk into the weight room and they're such good workers. They have great work ethic, but that actually is what set them back. Because they work so hard in the weight room, they destroyed their ability to, to move on the field. I've also seen guys that are lazy and they play fucking great on Saturday <laughs> because they don't do the weight room stuff. They don't work as hard in the weight room. They keep their movement better and they get labeled as lazy. But the reality is they just move, they know that something's wrong with what's going on there. It doesn't feel right to them. Like AI, Randy Moss, you've heard guys talk about that where, man, I'm not lifting weights. I'm just going to go play ball. And so that's kind of where there's a little bit of like, you can work hard and you can have that work ethic and we can still create that environment where everybody in the weight room is, the music's up, the chalk's flying around, there's sweat everywhere and there's a good energy in the gym, but it's centered around the right pattern for the sport. And that's what we've created down at Goda is it still has the same weight room vibe. You're getting your work in, you're sweating, your muscles are fatigued, you're tired, you're being challenged, but now you're just not doing it in that pattern that's not applicable to the field. You're doing it in a pattern that's gonna keep you secure because your best ability is availability. They say this day one mm. at camp. They say it. it's in high school, college, in pro meeting rooms. Your best ability is availability. All the while, we're sitting in chairs like this. We're eating fast food. You know, we're in the weight room. And we're not really doing things to make ourselves available for what is a long season. You know, and that's the, the, the tough part for the athlete is that you're now on someone else's watch, meaning someone else's schedule. You got to show up when the game is ready to play. And so when you're doing your own thing, you can set your own goals. You can set your own parameters. Say, hey, if I don't want to work on Tuesday, I don't work out on Tuesday. Well, guess what? The team's got a function you got to be at. So your body has to constantly be ready for the rigor. That's why training these athletes for longevity and for sort of security in the structure is going to do the best for the sport and for the athlete in the long run because you're not you're going to eliminate these non-contacts you're going to eliminate pulling great players off the field because they're just going to have a, a chance to compete a chance to stay out there because they're not doing things to take away from what was your first interaction with goda and what was your first impression um i had been looking at you know i i was i always go back to this book muscles and meridians because it brought me to the spinal engine and the spinal engine brought me to these guys because nobody else was talking about it and they're the, you know i came from core brace and keep everything straight and the, now the spinal engine saying no there's a wave and then gilly and gary were talking about it and then i reached out to them and when i started kind of inboxing gilly and he was like watch the acls watch the achilles and then go watch the back squats and the deadlifts. And that was like the eureka moment. I'm like, oh shit. Can you explain the spinal it's engine the same, to us? Yeah, yeah, it's the exact same thing. And so the, sp the spinal engine, um, well, that, that was kind of where I started and it was like quick. Mm -hmm. Before, within two weeks, I was on the phone with this guy every day. You know, we were just chatting it up and, and getting to know each other and talking about the system. And I was fortunate enough to really learn from Gary and Gilly <laughs> firsthand, you know, had them on the cell phone and able to call them at any point and just kind of pick their brains on this system. And then we developed things as we went. And, um, but to, to touch on the spinal engine, it's really as simple as saying, when you take that spine and just picture the thoracic to the lumbar, mm -hmm. you, if you had your hands on the top and the bottom and you bend it once, and then you bend it twice, it's going to turn. It's going to create this little cornering action where it's just going to kind of nestle in to a corner. Mm -hmm. And so you can do that with flexion or extension. This was what we were talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm. Flexion and extension, they're both on the table. Mm -hmm. Lateral flexion obviously is needed. And then that creates the rotary action that is this cornering movement. Now you're cornering energy out and then you're cornering energy in. When you corner the energy out and you kind of twist it into that, what we call a bow, that's the spiral outwards. So you have this flex, extend, lateral flex. You have all of them sort of oscillating together mm -hmm. in harmony with the, 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 the bicep bone, the, the forearm, the thigh, the shin. They're all working on that 22-5 together. So you can see how from ankle to wrist, with everything in between is and when you say 22 on the same five, mat. Yeah. You mean the angle of the joints. Yeah, so like as if you're looking at a body moving forward through space at you, if you were just to, to note three spots, if you were to note the sternum, the elbow pit, and the kneecap, I just wanna see those things point out to where it would look like it's pointing 22 and a half degrees off the midline of your body. 
Mm -hmm. So now when I point that out 22 and a half degrees, those bony landmarks are signifying a rotary turn inside the ball and sockets. So when I see the elbow pit point out slightly 22.5, what that's really telling me is that the forearm and the bicep bone have now turned in a rotary down, back, and out action. Same thing for the sternum. I see 22.5. Now I know that my spine is turning, and I see the kneecap pointing. Well, the kneecap's kind of the scope for the hip and the ankle. So the knee's just a hinge sitting in between, and your kneecap sort of becomes a scope to tell you what's going on above and below. So when you see the kneecap point out, it's showing you that the hip and the ankle are turning. We need that kneecap to point out off of a straight foot. Mm -hmm. So once the foot is straight and then we see the kneecap point out, like that joystick analogy we gave, now we know that, hey, we've wound everything up. And then once it's at 22.5, it's going to wash a full 45. So now you saw that kneecap pointing out 22.5, it's going to work to the other 22.5 on the inside. And so it's kind of like this windshield wiper type of vibe going back and forth. And it's just a rotor. It's really a linear way to look at a spiraled mechanism. And mm -hmm. it's an easy way to identify for a coach looking at a 2D screen. Okay. Now we were talking a lot about the ankles yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, why why is there so much ankle dysfunction? And when we were talking about in the context of how athletes train the tra train, train in the <laughs> weight room, um, how is that making it even worse for a lot of athletes? Yeah, the, the biggest error at the foot and ankle from just a overall, how are we looking at this thing in, in, its, in its design is that people aren't respecting it as a ball and socket, or they're not looking at it as a ball and socket. They're still saying it's a hinge. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the best analogy we can give <clears throat> as of right now to kind of make it simple is picture a joystick. Yeah. So you have a platform that the joystick sits inside. The platform doesn't move. I sent him some pictures. But the joystick can move once that platform holds still. Mm -hmm. That platform is your foot. So your foot needs to hold still. It's not doing the turning. It's the spiraled half dome structure that the ankle sits inside. So the talus, that ankle ball and socket, it's got a head, it's got a neck, it's just facing forward. So if you're looking at a foot, the, the navicular bone is like this facing front in front of you where your eyes are looking. And then you're just gonna, your talus is just gonna open and close. Your shin's gonna open and close off of that foot. The foot's gotta hold still though in order to let that ankle work. Yeah. Well, in order for that ankle to work, it's gotta be an inside ankle bone high foot. Mm -hmm. So that means the heel's gotta be out off the ground it's not out as an out. It's got to be out of the equation. It's got to be up. The inner ankle bone's got to be high, and you've got to have that foot straight. So now that, that talus can sit up. You see it on the image. That talus on the left, if you close that image like a book, that talus on the left is just going to fit into the foot. So as you're looking top down, you really plug the shin bone in like a joystick. Now keep that foot still, and then you turn the shin out and in. Mm -hmm. for, that shin, for that shin to be able to turn and that talus to be able to work, the foot needs to be in an inside ankle bone high structure. Now when you go to the training, unfortunately the training is doing really one thing. It's bringing you to the big toe, and it's bringing you into the heel. So now that talus is going to get stuck and it's gonna be taught to work off of the inside of the foot. It's gonna be taught to work off of the tripod foot or flat foot or something with the heels in the ground. That essentially ski boots the shin bone. It mm -hmm. stops that joystick from moving. And when that shin gets stuck, you can blow the knee and it can also create this harmony between the calcaneus and the shin and the talus. And if the heel's moving at all, that means the Achilles is unraveling. The heel's gotta sit still for the Achilles to wind up. So you see in this picture, the Achilles plugs into the heel. Mm. So now if the heel is moving in an inside ankle bone low fashion, it will unravel that Achilles tendon. It'll, it'll put too much slack into the system. Whereas when you go inside ankle bone high and you hold that heel still, then the shin bone turns out and in, it winds everything up in a spiral outward, and then boom, this comes back around the Achilles corner. Achilles is kind of a little dictated from the big toe is some of my understanding, right? I mean, so the, you, the Achilles is going to be, it can be destroyed by how your big toe is tracking. Yes. Right. Like if your big toe is pointing out, that's going to feed an inside ankle bone low pattern. It's essentially, if you go back to the other photo, Andrew, and you look at sort of the inside of the foot as the cliff side. Okay. So there's, there's no support over there. If you look at the outside of the foot, almost uh, outside of the foot, almost like, you know, you see the cascading of the toes. The, mm -hmm. the, the pinky toe is getting the smallest. Everything's sort of collecting down into that outside corner. So you're kind of sloping and all the energy is being collected in a, in a safe manner. Whereas when you go off the inside, it's like a cliff. You mm -hmm. There's nothing there for you. It just collapses. So now that shin sort of falls off of 
the foot platform, and That's now it's not have supported. Dome. Right, the now half, it's a half dome, dome concept. And this has been talked about for a long time. The inside of the foot, that part of the foot that you guys are talking about, the, the arch of the foot. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, people still have an arch. The arch of the foot is a non weight bearing <clears throat> part of the body, and it seems like a lot of what you guys are sharing is. Let's try to keep it that way as much yeah. as possible. So the, if someone's going to go ahead. The integrity of the foot is in the arch. Like once the arch collapse, the phone calls that we get on a, a daily basis is, listen, my son's got some knee pain. He's flat footed. Mm -hmm. that, that's how the conversation starts all the time. Oh, I got back pain. I'm flat footed. Once you lose that structure, the top is going to be dictated to, oh, it's going to be subject to change. Mm -hmm. And it's never going to be good. You, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, you go over a bridge. Let the bridge that you driving over lose its arch. And it's not always <laughs> <laughs> and it's not always so obvious, right? Like sometimes it's really obvious where yes. the kid looks like uh his kneecaps are like sewn together or right. something, right? Yeah, that valgus shape. And yeah. the and the feet are kind of outside of that. But sometimes it's like like uh we were working with Brad Kern today. We mm -hmm. were we were throwing some stuff his way and speed guy. Yeah, speed and he golf. Yeah, speed yeah. golf. Yeah, I he, like that guy. Yeah, he moves good. Mm -hmm. Like he's fifty seven, he's in great mm -hmm. shape. So like uh, but he kind of stands with his feet uh, mm -hmm. ducked out, and then you observed. You're like, "Hey, you got some problems on that side." He's like, "I sure do." The yeah. glute over here, and this <laughs> right. and that, right? Yeah, it's obvious now to you guys, but for a lot of people, maybe that are kind of looking into this, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, well, it's not so not so obvious, not so and, clear. And, and listen, Mark, whenever I've done probably a thousand evaluations, you know what I'm saying. So we have the 12 point system. We have the the evaluation process where you come in. We do everything video based, and we could show you a consistency in a Michael Jordan or Ed Reed or someone like that as opposed to who you are. So if those guys never really had repetitive stress injuries and knee pain and different problems like that, and you look at them and then I put them up standing, looking straight at you, we could look at alignment issues and things like that and then show you yourself. And right away, a lot of times is awareness like, oh, wait, so let me stand with straight feet, get my butt back a little bit and then kind of put the pressure to the outside. I have parents that come to me all the time. They sit through the kids' evaluation with us. The kid's getting better, and the dad comes in a month later, and he goes, man, I just uh, kind of started walking with straighter feet and stuff like that and alleviated some of my knee pain. So we know that there's something in it because of the repetition of all of the work that we've done. It's created a consistency in our program. So where we was at five years ago, as opposed to now, is way different. Mm -hmm. So we created the education process for the coaches where mm -hmm. those coaches could come in. We set up a system with a website. We set up where everything's plugged in to where every time me and Rick or, or RJ post something new or come up with some kind of new concept or advance something, because it's evolving because it's new. I mean, it's like it got real in 2019. You get rid of stuff. Yeah, you get rid of stuff. You mm -hmm. add new stuff. You find better ways to do things. Those coaches that are plugged into that system are, are, are helping tons and tons of people. You know, I mean, we got probably 200 people that's went through the cert. We might have 40 or 50 coaches that's really plugged in and trying. You know what I'm saying? So the more that the system evolves, they're going to evolve with that. So, you know, if you try to go to a while back, you might want to come back and, and look at some Ricky, things. Ricky, can you, can you explain? Uh, you, you just explained it so uh, well to Brad about how to stand. And mm -hmm. I just thought I, I, I've heard you guys say a lot of things, but I haven't heard it. Uh, really broken down that way, and it just seems so simple. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is how far away are your feet from each other? So you want to get them a fist-width distance apart. Your your hip is sitting much closer to the middle of the body, the spine, than you think. I think we put our hands and we feel the greater trochanter. We're like, oh, my hips are out there. I'll put my feet out there. It's like, no, the ball and socket is actually much closer. And all of us are like <laughs> shoulder width, like yeah, face right, to face. Yeah. My shoulders are this wide. Right? <laughs> right. So now you want to get sort of underneath that ball and socket so that it has some support. So it starts right there. Get yourself a fist width distance apart, and then make sure that your second toe is pointing straight. From there, treat your heels like eggshells. So you don't want to crunch the eggshell. So you just want to be very light in that heel area, almost feeling like it's not holding any pressure at all. You should feel the pressure, though, really on that outside edge of the foot, like right below the outer ankle bone. There's a bone called the cuboid. It's right in front of the heel to the outside. Now, you can dig into that. You can sit on that. You can kind of lean into that. You will when you're standing and when you're walking and when you're getting into your resting squat. So you're really super comfortable. Yeah, it should mm -hmm. feel very comfortable. You should feel very supported. So heels are eggshells. My feet are straight. My feet are a fist-width distance apart. 
my second toe is pointing straight. And then there's some other things we want to point straight as well. I want my kneecaps to be pointing straight ahead. Mm -hmm. And I want my elbow pits to be pointing straight ahead or my thumbs. So if you're kind of imagine yourself holding two briefcases and just thumbs pointing straight ahead, chest pointing straight ahead, kneecaps pointing straight ahead with straight feet, you're getting your vertical. Now you're supported. Right, And then if you wanted to sit on one side, which is normal, you can hang out like the Statue of David, you can hang out on one side of the body, your body will actually just rest inside the corner. You still wanna rest inside ankle bone high, you still wanna be back chain dominant, but there's all these like really ancient resting postures that we observe from whether it's Michael Jordan or the Maasai tribe, they'll sit on one side and they'll just sit in their back chain in the corner. So your resting postures, your waiting postures are getting everything ready Up for the movement that follows right after. Yeah, and you can see how close the hip sits to really that sacrum pelvis sort of inner inner workings of the spine and, and um, pelvis area. So you need to kind of get your feet closer. Your feet are gonna be close for the majority of your day. Think about it, the majority of your day is standing, it's waiting around and then it's walking and then it's resting on the ground. When you get into the world of sports and you now create a two-way go, now you, you're reacting. So you're either gonna create a, an illusion of I'm gonna go right or left, or you've gotta guard somebody that's going right or left. So even when you see wider columns in sport, it's still gonna be pressurizing one side of the body. They're just creating a two-way go at stride length because it's like, think of stealing second. I may have to go back to first, or I may run to go to second. So I'm kind of giving myself a two-way go. It'd be the same thing if I'm running a slant, I'm gonna create the illusion and that about, I may go one way. And they're about to distribute an enormous amount of weight They're gonna just load side. a bow on one side and then corner to the other right. side. So it's still gonna be the same pattern. That's still gonna be a, there's, there's one pattern playing out when you go to locomote, when you go to move. And that's what we're trying to say is that the whole design is predicated around, I'm at point A, I need to move to point B to affect change on my environment. How do I do that? You load a bow and then you corner it and now you're at point B and then you go ahead and you reset on the other side and you do it again. And so that basic pattern moving from point A to point B, the stride, the gait cycle is Goda and that is the inner workings of who you are. It is the design. And then when you rest, you just fold the system up inside the Goda framework and then you stand back up and you're right back ready to move again. So the walking, the resting is really to kind of talk about or piggyback what Gary was saying about you know, even dads or moms just listening in and just doing, making a few changes, they don't realize that those little changes that they're making by standing, those are actually the most reps you get in a day. Mm -hmm. Your walk and your rest is like 90% of your day, even if you're a, you know, gung-ho, like working out hard in the weight room for two hours, you're still gonna spend so much more time in your resting area of, of, of your day and in your walking area. So if you can start to make those things go to, the great news is, is that it's gonna become subconscious eventually. So you're gonna look down at your feet one day and target and be like, oh shit, there they are, like they did it. I didn't have to tell them to do it. It just takes time early on mm -hmm. to kind of, just the same way you wrecked it, you can fix it. You just didn't know you were wrecking it before because you were putting your feet crooked or you weren't aware. Now we bring you back to that awareness and you start making little changes, making little changes. And I tell people, when you notice yourself woda, don't get discouraged. You should actually be encouraged because you've just made a connection to your mm -hmm. brain that like, well, that's a good rep. Now you're waking your brain up to something new and then eventually you stack those reps. And then, like I said, one day you look down and you're like, oh, that's much cleaner. And then you go to sprint and it looks clean too. When kids come in and like, because when I was 15, 16, um, I was told that I was flat footed and mm -hmm. I was given orthotics. Yeah. Um, nowadays, because I've changed the way that I do things with my feet, I have an arch, that's not an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know that when I was younger. So when kids are coming to you guys, you probably have dealt with hundreds of kids who have been given orthotics mm -hmm. specifically for sport or have been told they're flat footed. What is the prime reason that you see that's the problem there? Because it, it's, while that can be reversed. Mm -hmm. um, and there are probably very just specific situations where a person is truly flat footed, but mm -hmm. that is not, that's not common. Yeah, the, the, you know, the being flat footed or having orthotics, you could see the orthotics, it's like a sofa. Even the arch support in your shoe, it's like a sofa. It's, it doesn't, it's a passive way of changing foot structure. Whereas mm -hmm. being inside ankle bone high and doing work on the arch of the foot is active. You're gonna actively be holding your foot structure up. So the, the 
orthotic is just kind of a band-aid and it's never really going to change the behavior of your foot mm. until you go in there and you make some active inputs you put some active inputs into the system to train it to be stronger develop the muscle on the outside of the calves get the ankle to be on you know unglued a little bit yeah. get the back chain to work and, and, and open up so that that ankle can open and close and that foot contract the way it should how a kid's foot gets to that point listen you're subject to decode the second you come out of the womb so inside the womb, inside the developmental process, this is also in muscles and meridians, inside that embryological development, it's GOTA. Your leg musculature literally spirals inward. And if anybody has kids or you, you know that moment of birth and the baby comes out, it's all tucked fetal, inside ankle bone high, toes in, heels away. So you develop into inside ankle bone high, back chain dominance. You have the motor pattern there from the onset. It's what the kick is in the belly. The mm -hmm. baby's kicking, it's just bowing and cornering. And then once the baby comes out, it's been in this field of liquid, it's, it's now in a field of gravity and its head's huge. And so it can't mm -hmm. lift its head up, its body's too small. It needs like six to eight months of nourishment before it can go ahead and then it can use that motor engine again. So it's a similar to a car being in the shop and the engine's fine, but all the fucking body work and the pain is terrible. We gotta get it up to speed and then boom, you put the tires down, that thing rolls. And that's like eight, nine months or right around when that kid starts to crawl. But if you're coming out of the womb and for whatever reason, mom's got you in a weird foot, you know, uh, a, a shoe, some sort of foot support thing or some sort of shoe that they think's cute mm -hmm. that they want to put you in, or you tend to be resting in a funny way that maybe is predicated off of where you're sitting or you're in a, you know, you're in a, um, the car seat and you're sitting in your front chain. Like kids are being decoded very young. They're just super resilient to it because you're, they're closer to the source and you're born GOTA or you're develop, developing GOTA in the embryo. But then once you come out of that, once you come out of the womb, you're in a new environment. And whatever that environment is, it's gonna code up. That's why parents can, if they're aware of resting positions, parents can start to kind of clean up the foot and ankle behavior for their kids. And then other things like, don't grab your kid's hand when they're walking. Like, don't pull your kid's hand like this. You don't realize what that's doing to them. Don't rush them to stand up. Mm. Keep them on the ground. Keep them barefoot. Keep them inside ankle bone high. Keep them in Seiza. Keep them in crisscross applesauce. Let them sit at the chair in a squat. Let you, them sit at a chair in Seiza. You guys were talking about some baby playing thing that actually reinforces bad position. What's the bouncy thing or whatever? Oh, that little, it's a, <clears throat> they got like, it's a little cart like, and it's got wheels on it. And then it's got like a spring system in mm -hmm. it where they could jump. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, is when you put their legs in it, the holes for the legs put them put the legs kind of open and out where they kind of duck foot it in there. Yeah. So they start bouncing open like this, yeah. like Instead ballet, of like it's, it's like a ballet like, sort of. It's not like... a straight foot thing. <clears throat> yeah. And then my son had this little water bike. I called it. <laughs> it didn't have pedals, so you had to use your feet to push yourself. <laughs> yeah. And he would just push inside uh, edge. Water bike. I seen him ride it. It was like a Christmas gift too. He went to bed. I picked it up and threw it in the car. <laughs> 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 I'm like, hell yeah, I threw it away. <laughs> Dude's valgus already. Like, right, right. Uh, you know what I'm saying? We got problems with him. He's scared. My little girl beats him up. <laughs> <laughs> what are what are some? Because uh, we did talk about we we had uh, somebody in here was asking you some questions, Gary, uh, and they were they were on their bike a lot, and you were like, oh, a bike, like where you strap, you know, get your feet locked yeah. in. That actually can be uh, pretty good for the that, feet. Obviously, there's other structural things where you might be screwed on that. But like, what are some natural things? that people should be doing. I know you guys promote the floor a lot. Get on mm -hmm. the floor, get on the floor, get on the floor. Is there some other activities that would promote this or do we have to actively be super connected to paying attention to not letting that foot duck out and uh, not having that inside ankle bone low? Well, I mean, I think the walk is the number one activity you want to you mm -hmm. want to tap into because you're going to get so many reps of that. Mm -hmm. The resting, like you said, just even you're not going to get your whole day to be a floor resting. Um, you know, you're not going to probably jump to that. You're going to have to be in the car. You're probably going to have to be at a desk at some point. But if you can steal five to ten minutes here and there in the morning at night and kind of spread it out and get back to those po positions, even if it's just a minute or two minutes, that's better than not being mm. in those positions at all. And just the act of going up and down from the ground, we don't even think about the fact that our knees don't even fully close. Like imagine if your elbow couldn't fully close, like you wouldn't be able to feed yourself. Like, well, your knee's similar. Like it needs to close for the health of the ankle and the hip. Like everything needs to work together. So just getting back to the ground, just getting into the walk, those are good things. The bike is very tricky because the bike 
while you could lock those feet in and you could kind of start to wiggle your ankles if you know what you're doing, the bike would be best if you're off the seat. Because mm. if you're off the seat, now you can keep the back chain and you can really, I mean, you Head watch the, the watch like BMX guys when they go and they go real quick out of the gates. It's like the, the bike handles are bowing and cornering. Like they're, <laughs> it's a wave motion. So you're going to see the bow and corner happen on a bike. The problem would be is if you're on the bike and you're like this. Mm. And you're just like, you know, you're, you're Sunday riding. Yeah, you're yeah. Sunday riding. You got to be very careful because it's very easy just to go back to the essential chair posture that you're just so used to. Mm. And then if your feet are, you know, if you're if you're on the pedals, be careful with your heels pushing into the pedal. Get into the get into the inside ankle bone high sort of setting on your on your pedal so that your heel's not doing the pushing. Stay on the outside ball of the foot and then do more riding where, yeah, maybe you go ahead and you sit the butt down and you're riding and then lift the butt up for extended periods and kind of use the bike as a sort of a way to help you bow and corner. I know because we have a lot of people that they want, they want to ride their bike. Mm -hmm. They want to do those activities. I think that's one that you can modify. You just have to be very aware of what you're doing. You know, people see you, you're 6'5", right? Mm -hmm. Okay. They see you with your feet maybe a fist full or fist apart, mm -hmm. maybe a fist and a half, and you just sit great into this squat. Mm -hmm. um, one question is like, I'm assuming you didn't necessarily have that ability until you started working on creating space within that ankle. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, is that something that you think most people or everybody should be able to do because you know tall guys for example their thing anyone over like five foot nine or whatever they're like i'm too big to squat in that right. position i my body's just not made for that it's good for short people yep uh, and i'm sorry i don't mean to diss any short people out there. <laughs> but that's what tall athletes always say yep. i can't get that deep i don't have that type of mobility femur length because my like, femur length yeah. etc so what is missing there for people mm -hmm. to be able to get into those positions what are they what do they need to develop yeah that's a great question i mean really to go and if back you could pull up like him it goes it, back to that, that ball means, and socket yeah. at the ankle. So, so many people are, you know, they're being, they're looking at the squat from a side view and they're mm -hmm. seeing what they think is dorsiflexion. So everyone's going hard on this dorsiflexion, dorsiflexion to try to get that sort of like hinge action. The problem there is that you could have suppleness that's inside ankle bone low. So we'll see people that show up and they're bendy, they're stretchy, they got the flexibleness, but the foot platform has to collapse in order for them to achieve that suppleness. Mm -hmm. At Goda, we teach and preach inside ankle bone high suppleness. So you want to be supple while you hold inside ankle bone high back chain dominance. Now to get your squat rehabbed, you actually want to spend more time on the first quarter range of the movement then you are necessarily spending time just trying to get down into the bottom and like just hang out down there. That's a great point. So if you can clean up the first quarter range and you can put your feet fist width distance apart, second toes straight, get your inner ankle bones high, get out of your heel. And then the first thing you need to do is you got to get your tailbone going back and the crown of your head going forward. You want to literally like max that out to a 10, almost to where you, it should be to where your belly button and your chest are pointing at the ground. So it should feel like what would people would call a hinge, yeah. but you're really just getting into your back chain. We would call that a state of decompression because in that state of decompression, I can bow mm -hmm. or I can corner. I have space to open up the hip. And once that hip is open and that ankle has opened up, then all I got to do is just close my kneecap, my, my, my knee hinge. And I just go ahead and I, I hinge out my knee and then I sit my butt down to my heels. Now I was able to get low, but I was always low inside ankle bone low. Yeah. So then when I so first learned relaxed. this, like I would try to squat inside ankle bone high and I'd be like, whoa, I would just like fall backwards because mm -hmm. I didn't have the turn in the ankle. And that was something I had to really rehabilitate <clears throat> and go after. But it started from just trying to conquer the first quarter range to where I set the bow, my kneecap points out, my feet are straight. And then all I got to do is hinge out the knee and just keep going, keep going. And then you'll sit down into the squat. If you start it that way, and we have an <clears throat> exercise we call the access squat where you're gonna go based off of what you have available to you. So we'll give you a weight in your hands, like a, a kettlebell, and you're gonna use the counterbalance to your advantage. So you're gonna put that counterbalance out there, you're gonna start in your quarter range, and if you go and drop down, let's say you go two inches mm -hmm. and you feel stuck, stop right there. That's the area you kinda wanna floss through and go back and forth and just kind of let that area sort of 
give the nervous system permission for you to use it. Mm. It'll start to like kind of, okay, I feel stronger here. I feel aware here. Let's go a little bit lower. Then you drop down four inches, six inches. Now you're at a halfway point. You get really strong all the way down. So clear from a top down perspective, as opposed to just slamming the suitcase shut and just saying, well, I'm gonna hang out down here at the bottom. You've never really created any access at the top and more likely than not, you're in your front chain at the bottom or somewhat inside ankle bone low in your heel. What I've seen a lot of, happen to a lot of people when they go to squat down and they start to go low, they get to a certain point where there's compromise. You know, there's compromise yeah. in the back, there's compromise in the hips, there's compromise somewhere. Yep. And almost always, I could say, uh, I could say pretty clearly that I haven't really seen many people squat here at Super Training out of all the years we've had the gym uh, do a squat where their foot doesn't start to du – like if they're trying to keep their foot straight, yeah. it starts the turning. foot yeah. will turn out mm. and they'll automatically almost put themselves into an Olympic lifting shoe a little mm -hmm. bit. They'll rock towards their toes, their heel – now, it might be very slight. The heel is like making less contact mm -hmm. with the ground or sometimes coming off the ground slightly if they're trying to really bury their squats. Yeah. Uh, luckily, in powerlifting, you don't have to like get as low, as, get as, low right. as like an Olympic lifter. Mm -hmm. But Olympic lifters, they do the same thing. When they go to do a clean, they just throw the feet out. They, mm -hmm. Boom, they throw the feet out. They do drive the knee out, which is probably helpful and probably uh, can prevent injuries because the foot is pointed out so aggressively. But that inside ankle bone, you're right. It does, <clears throat> it does kind of want to dip inward uh, during those motions. And then on top of that, people are trying to do so with a lot of weight. Sometimes mm -hmm. double double their body weight yeah. on their back. When when you look at a lot of the like shin <clears throat> angle programs and things like that, where they talk about shin angles, you'll see it a lot of times in the track and field world. It was it was literally just all based from the side. Like nobody actually looked at the squat from the front and the back in comparison to what was happening when somebody would come out of the track blocks or something like that. They're bowing. They should be bowing and cornering. When you see the soft tissue injury set in is when you start to see them <coughs> either lose the bow the right way or the corner because it stresses out the system. Now, if you go in there, if you go inside ankle bone low with a duck foot and you try to set a bow and then you try to corner that hip, that's a recipe to explode that hamstring or that groin or the, or the or quad area. or something. Yep. Yeah, any kind of injury like that. Whereas, like, if you look, th th that's what was missing. That's a big missing piece. That's why extension, flexion, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. So you'll see these slant boards that are used sometimes to try to get them to a certain shin angle, but it's not respecting the bow in the corner of how the hip opens and closes. So you can't treat the top like a ball and socket and then treat the bottom like a hinge because the result is a sport with my, uh, enormous amount of soft tissue in there. And soft yeah, yeah. And soft t and soft tissue. So <clears throat> but it's gotta be the more that foot gets crooked, like you're saying, the more that shin's like falling off the cliff. Mm -hmm. And so the tibia, the the, the tibia, the talus <clears throat> is falling off the cliff because it's losing support. So the more crooked that foot, the the more difficult it's going to be to set that bow. And then it's going to be really hard to get that corner to come all the way around. I mean, you can just see it as my foot's crook and I try to turn, I'm essentially blocking my hip with my foot mm. because of the way that pivot point's going to set down. So happy you pulled this up, Andrew. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, that's a classic. That was, that was what we, when, when we talk about that, that knee setting out and that ankle climbing high, you could see where his ankle sits that it's inside ankle bone high. Mm -hmm. They got another one that I sent you, Andrew, the other indigenous guy from head on. Yeah, see how that ankle plays on the, the outside top of the heel like that with the spread foot, the foot's still a platform, and that shin's able to open like that. Well, that's that's how it's got to be. And this ends that whole, like, well, only the babies can do it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, right. what are you talking about? Like, there's another human doing it right mm -hmm. there that's an adult. So, I mean, there's my daughter, Rosie. We didn't teach her this. Like, she just does this stuff. The babies just do yeah. this. Mm -hmm. there, that's hey. the other thing I try to tell people. You know, you know that guy? Representation. <laughs> yeah. This Look is the boy. thing that people got to understand. Nobody <laughs> created the squat. Nobody created the hinge. Nobody created crisscross applesauce. Nobody created Seiza. No one created the walk. No one created the throw. But somebody created the Olympic lift. Mm -hmm. Somebody created the back squat. Those are man-made things. So right. when you look at what the baby just... 
the toddler comes out and is just doing naturally, they're sitting in Seiza. Even if you put them in a chair, they don't sit like you sit in a chair. You have to teach them to sit on their ass and put their feet on the ground. They want to sit inside ankle bone high. They want to rest inside ankle bone high. They want to pick up sticks and swing them. They want to pick up rocks and throw them. The walk, the run, the throw, the swing. It's who you are. It's the fabric of who you are. All you could do to a kid is essentially take it away from them with man-made concepts or man-made ideas that don't first and foremost say, wait a second, what's nature got to say about this? What is the objective reality of nature saying about this sort of arena that I'm looking at? People are doing this with diet. They're doing it with their sleep and stuff like that. But we're just saying, do it with your musculoskeletal system. Look at what the children do. Look at what the indigenous, those that have been in the wild and they have not come out of the Amazon, they're staying in that natural habitat. That environment is always gonna saturate the system in really good walking reps and really good, really good resting reps. And that's why it's so hard to lose it in these societies where you have to get back to the ground. Mm. You don't have the chairs everywhere. You don't have the Nike shoes everywhere. You're usually barefoot and you're resting on the ground. You're going to keep that same stuff you got when you came out of the womb as a kid. I think that there's some ways to mitigate some of what you're talking about. And I think this is the brilliance of, <clears throat> you know, somebody like my mentor, Louis Simmons, and some of the things I've been taught about the squat. Now we did squat really wide, but that was to be able there to lift. There was intention behind it. Yeah, to lift. Built around the lift. Yeah. yeah, to lift X amount of mm -hmm. weight. But we also did a lot of box squats. And when I look around and I start to think about who's still like left, who's still kind of standing, who gets to pick and choose what they want to do now that their powerlifting career is over. And the only guys that I know is just a handful of dudes that also did box squats as well. Mm -hmm. And they did so with some proficiency. Now box squat, you're going to sit way back. You're going to kind of go into that as you guys talk about the back chain. You're going to sit back. The shins are actually going to be more straight up and down. Mm -hmm. you're, not, you're not going, you know, your ass to the floor. Right, right. You're going about, mm -hmm. about to parallel. And the way I was taught to squat was to, was to have my feet straight and was to push my knees out. And my knee had to go over where my ankle was. My knee had to go out. I remember Louis. Outside of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember, yeah. I remember mm -hmm. specifically, he was like, if you don't get your knee out to where your shoelaces are, he's like, you got to bring your stance in a little bit until mm -hmm. you can get stronger. Then you get stronger hips. And over time, you should be able to push out, push out, push out. And even Louis, late into his 50s, uh, being all banged up, could perform some box squats with really good form. As he got older, started to like degenerate because mm -hmm. he did so many things poorly when he mm -hmm. was young. Um, but I think that that was a that's something that has left me in a position now to say like, hey, I think I'm going to run, and I yeah. think maybe in a couple of years I'd like to be able to pick up this sport or that sport. Where I see a lot of other guys, a lot of lifters, a lot of, there's a lot of people that not just our general public. Like it makes sense the general public's banged up; they don't really move enough and. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe they're not eating well and they have, there's a lot of bad habits probably, right? <clears throat> but there's a lot of fitness people that are really banged up. There's a lot of lifters. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, where their back is all tight and this is tight and this is messed up and that's messed up. And I don't feel that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you said something earlier when we started the, the show and seeing what, what, about, you know, this is not about power lifting, but it really it can be about power lifting because, you know, Mark, what you're saying right now is, is that, as as the age goes up, the percentage of injury that's in that sport, it grows, right? So that goes up also with the age. If you would have had a system like what we have as more of a security infrastructure to the things that you're doing to help decompress, if it would have been 20 minutes of your day, every day, that whole time through your powerlifting career, you probably would have never reached back. Like you wouldn't have been looking for something to go run a half marathon with or mm -hmm. something like that. You would have had something that was in place for you. And and another thing too, that, you know, it kind of like in what you were saying, you got to realize too, that a lot of what we see in is these high school and college athletes, right? That's probably, and we get a lot of gen pop, a lot of gen pop, right? Because like they are 50 something years old, they could come in and they could feel better. That guy that wants to go do that high jump, mm -hmm. we could clean him up mm -hmm. and help him get better and get his jump up too at 57 years old, because we know he's got an inefficiency that if he cleans up, he's got to get better. But think about this. There's probably like, a hundred high schools, may, maybe more in Louisiana. I don't know. How many of them they got in California? How many of them they got around the country? 
They don't have a Mark Bell in there teaching them how to squat at the lowest level. If you was a, a performance coach or a strength coach, at, you would be at the highest level. See, the, the problem is, is it, and then it, it kind of trickles downhill because at the middle school where they're getting introduced to this shit and that ankle capsule's getting destroyed in the very beginning and then they're going to put thousands of steps on top of it. They got the seventh grade science teacher in there that watched your podcast that's teaching people how to squat. That shit don't work. So you start getting these kids that are broken down. And like we said the other day, I got kids in my area that need football. They mm -hmm. need sports to give themselves an opportunity possibly at a better life. Not grades and all of that stuff and all of that's important. But when you live in an environment sometimes that shows you this is what life is, and that's the only possibility that you have in your mind as a way out, you can't get fucked up your junior year of high school when you got 40 offers and then you have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to do because nobody really took the time to go listen to somebody get that shit right. Because if you could run at 57, them kids should be able to run at 57 if they choose to do those things. But that's not happening. That's not the way it is today. You know what I'm saying? It's just not It's just not I've it. I've seen a lot of people. Social media is a problem, too, because they see that shit on social media, and they want to, like what you said earlier about playing soccer, and like, man, well, we didn't have YouTube and all of this. Dude, it's like Denzel said. You either misinformed or uninformed. One or the two. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, that's where we at right now with everything. It, it, they not The great coaches are not at the lower level, and that's probably where they should be. Mm. There ain't no money. There's a lot of info to sift through. You know, there's, there's like a, a lot, lot of info. Fifteen year old can't to figure sift that out. through. It's tough when there's you know everyone's telling you that your knee can get, that they can fix your knee. Everyone's telling you we can get you more endurance, better cardio, better strength. It's like, well, who do I listen to? You know, and that was kind of what going back to my own journey and looking at stuff. I was like, just give me the damn truth. Like what? And eventually, it was like, well, nature's got the truth. There's an objective reality out here, and I got to first pay homage to that, and then I can train accordingly. And so if people just know that awareness, like you're speaking to modifications, if you know how to modify your day-to-day, -day, cause you're living in sort of a woe to lifestyle. Like we've got poor footwear that's everywhere around us. We have these chairs that are non-negotiable. They're gonna be in certain aspects of your life. But if you can kind of mitigate some of that and, and sort of create more of a go to lifestyle around it, you're gonna have the longevity. And that's really what people are looking for. Like that's eventually, you went through the powerlifting career and eventually you're like, dude, I want my longevity back. Like mm -hmm. I wanna be able to run around with my kids. I wanna have my long-term health. So that's something that, it's a birthright for everybody. And that's what I think Gary's saying with the powerlifters is, if you're a powerlifter, keep doing your powerlifting. If you're an Olympic lifter, keep Olympic lifting. All we're saying is that 13 year old kid that wants to play quarterback, he doesn't give a shit about powerlifting. He wants to throw a fucking deep post. Like he's a locomotive athlete. Same thing for the golfer, the basketball player, the soccer player. Those athletes need to be treated differently. Yeah. They need to be strictly on a go to diet. But even the power lifter and the Olympic lifter, you need to eat some go to as well because you're a human being first that has fallen in love with a sport. Remember that, like you're a human being that's built for locomotion, walk, jog, run, walk, jog, run, walk, jog, run. Yeah, you do one lifting rep to pick up the dead animal or pick something up, but you're back into the locomotive mm -hmm. framework. So if you're someone that's gonna saturate the system in the lift, you could argue you probably need go to just as much, maybe not more than somebody who is just gonna be walking and running and throwing and swinging. Yeah. Because you're gonna put so much stress on that system that you need something to kind of, yeah, maybe you take uh, you know two steps back, you take a step forward there with go to, as far as it would be from a standpoint of like the system getting compressed. Because if you let that compression compound, that's when you wake up all of a sudden and you're 55, 60, and you're like, oh shit, what happened to that hip? And then trying to get it back when you're at 60 and the nervous system's not as malleable, it's tough. It's yeah. a lot tougher. So if you at least had a plan as you went into powerlifting and you knew that, hey, powerlifting's a heels down sport. It's going to code this into my nervous system the wrong way. I'm going to have this go to here as a wash away. That's going to let me have a longer powerlifting career. And then when I choose to put the weights down, I can go back to just being a human. I'm not going to have pills, surgery, shots that I have to deal with on the back end of my life. I can go ahead and kind of ride off into the sunset and have all your longevity still available to you. Yeah. Pat Project Family, how's it going? Now, a lot of you guys are lifters, athletes. You're serious about the gym, and we are too. And that's why we've been using Slingshot products for years, all right? You have the original Slingshot, obviously the glittery pink hip circle, which is my <laughs> personal favorite. But if you don't like that, then you have the normal hip circle that's used to warm up the hips. But on the website, they have tons of equipment, knee sleeves, elbow sleeves, 
the gangster raps right there. <laughs> so you need to go check him out and add you. Can you tell him more about it? Yes, that's over at markbellslingshot.com. And at checkout, enter promo code POWERPROJECT10 to save 10% off your entire order. Uh, links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah. No, uh, as far as what you're saying, Gary, and, and both of you guys, if, if you're specifically a power lifter or you're specifically a bodybuilder, like this, the things that you guys do as far as the go to warm up is fucking genius. Like mm -hmm. if, if, if somebody were to be able to do that before they get into their lifting, mm -hmm. open up those ankles, open up those hips, do some of that before they have to go lift. That's great. But then also within your lifts, can you change some of the ways that you actually squat or deadlift? Mm -hmm. You know, Kelly Sturette's always <clears> talked <throat> about, I mean, I think you mentioned it, the, the three points of contact, right? But creating that arch. Now, if you're doing the warm up, right, where you're now able to get more room in that, in your ankle, maybe that, not just that arch you create, but like the way the knee comes outwards when you're hitting a squat, mm -hmm, maybe mm -hmm. you're able to get into a better foot position where your feet don't have to be out here when you're squatting you'll be able to squat more comfortably here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Overall, you're doing less damage in the long run because now when you're 10 years from now or 15 years from now, when you decide to stop competing mm -hmm. and you, at this point, your priorities are like, I want to feel really good and still be strong and still be jacked. Mm -hmm. You're not so jacked up yeah. that there's there's... There's just way more rewinding to do. Yeah, yeah. you know, yep. Ke Kelly Kelly did do a great job of identifying a platform that was the best for the lift. And he identified the three, torque. Yeah, the, the three the points. Yeah. yeah, the three points of contact. What we're saying is those three points of contact are not transferable to, to sport. a sport. Mm -hmm. I understand. Right. Yeah. yeah, so when we take the heel up and out and we get off the big toe, that one point of contact becomes. It, and it and it could you don't have to look at it as the pinpoint. Don't take it from the context of what he was saying where it was, but take it from four through five to where you can have that platform set in yeah. a locomotive mm -hmm. setting and then not budge, yeah. right? To where that shin could open and that heel could just whip away with it and give it the freedom to do that. Going into the lift engine part of it, when you start compressing that ankle into the heel, is when you start to have some problems. So when you look at the go to warm up, like you just said, you add that into there and it keeps the heel compressed. Even though you go compress it a little bit, you could probably keep it compressed. So it's great for the it decompress, Olympic yeah. le decompress. That's mm -hmm. what I mean. You could you could keep it like, like it should be, and it's great for the power lift or Olympic lift or anything like that. And it, one of the things we're sitting up here and we're talking about this because it's it's crazy to me because a lot of the strength coaches in my area. Like, they'll sit there, y'all don't know what y'all talking, and, and then it's like, we come here, and y'all have seen the best in the world at the whole strength side of it. You've had them on your show, you've worked with them, you've trained under them, you've done all of that stuff. And it's like, y'all are saying this, and then they'll go, well, yeah, they, they wrong. Like, it's like the ego part of the whole thing, too, starts to become an issue or whatever. It's just... You know, mm -hmm. something that we deal with on, on a regular basis well, or whatever. Well, for, for the modification thing, like, th the best way I could say it, listen, if you're a locomotive athlete, we don't, like you had said earlier, we don't need you doing any of that. The sad reality is, though, that our locomotive athletes are doing that. They mm -hmm. have to do those lifts. So what we tell them is tr try to be as go-to as possible before you start the position, mm -hmm. right? So if you're like in a super woda position doing these lifts, like you said, you're really doing more damage than the guy who is in a go-to position. Now, the pattern's still gonna work in reverse. Whether you try to or not, the heel's gonna go down when you go to deadlift, the heel's gonna go down when you back squat, it's still going to do that in to out pattern. But if you can at least start in a more go-to position and you can kind of come at it from that frame, that frame of mind, you'll at least be like you're stopping what could be even more compression yeah. in the system if you were to just go straight way outside, totally crooked foot, no awareness of what's going on, yeah. and then just squatting. So while we, we're never gonna say, yeah, deadlift can be GOTA or back squat can be GOTA, there's a way to at least approach the bar in a more GOTA framework for somebody that feels like I love to lift. I am an Olympic lifter, I am a power lifter, I am mm -hmm. a bodybuilder, I need this in my life. There's a way to at least hold off on some of that bleeding and then be able to, like you said, when you are done, you're at least not as damaged as what you would have been if you had no awareness and mm -hmm. you were just super front chain and super crooked foot. The problem that it gets into with your locomotive athletes is from a neurological standpoint. Yeah. If that nervous system is in its squat, remember the squat is the landing. 
the hinge is the leaving. So when you're patterning your squat and you're telling your squat, hey, max neural drive, our heel's in the ground and we're going to drive, they're going to take that to the field. And even if that foot is straight, they could still lock that ankle up and blow the knee or blow the Achilles. That's, so that's yeah. where it becomes a, a little bit of nuance that, and that's like the hardest thing with our college and our, our even high school, college and pro guys is like, dude, they're still subject to deadlifts. They're still subject to back squats. Like we try to wash away as much of that as possible by saturating the nervous system and as much goda outside of that, which is where the 90% comes in, mm -hmm. your walk, your rest. If we can kind of own that part of our lives, we're at least going to get the most reps that we would get in our day. No matter how many squats you do in that weight room, you're going to get thousands of reps of walking and you're going to get a lot of time under stress in your resting um, pattern. So if you can lock that in, you're in a much better position. But for your bodybuilders, your Olympic lifters, your, your CrossFitters and stuff, there's a way to at least enter the bar and at least mitigate some of that. But but don't fool yourself to think that, well, I can bow and corner on my back squat or deadlift because there's like a, there's a very fine line there. And that's where we, we want to educate the industry. We want people, we want power lifters to reach yeah. out to us. We want Olympic lifters because we know we can help them. And we have young power lifters. We have a coach, Dante Enos, that's just signed up and he's a power lifter and he works with power lifters. And he is somebody that's like, dude, I stopped doing as much power lifting. I'm still power lifting. I'm aware that it's reverse and all that. And I know I'm not going to do this forever, but just by adding Goda, I was plateauing and now I'm breaking through those plateaus because I'm getting more decompressed. I'm being a better version of me before I walk up to that bar. And I'm mm -hmm. a little more Goda as I stand over that bar. That is good for the CrossFitter, the Olympic lifter, the power lifter, the bodybuilder, and they should try to adopt some of that in their world. But for your locomotive athletes, just completely stay away from them. So it's kind of like a, there's a little bit of both of those going on. Did I'm just curious. In the last episode that you guys had, did we get some visual contact or uh, visual context of like what you showed me yesterday? Why, when athletes have their heels down, you know how that's so negative? Because you showed all those videos of mm -hmm. how all of these injuries are happening. Mm -hmm. when I think these we athletes had the, land. Yeah, their the, heels the, down. we did it ACL. the other day too. You pulled the a, the the. Alabama kid mm. was heels Yeah, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think it would be good just real quick to touch on it again to touch on yeah, it yeah, specifically yeah, yeah. for athletes because yep. if you're a powerlifter bodybuilder or strength athlete you're not going on a field you're not sprinting and you're moving not in different directions it yeah. so it's not even any like I mean yeah you do want the concepts to keep your knees out not going super valid when you're doing these movements but you're also not the person who's changing directions right. quickly mm -hmm. and I think it would help a lot of people understand because when you say don't squat and when you say yeah, don't right, deadlift right. it's immediately going to be like, what the fuck? Right. They put a light right. up. So yeah. how about we get some visual context of why actually maybe you don't want to drill that pattern mm -hmm. in if you are a field athlete. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. You know what's crazy is I yeah. got... Um I got that thing of Jalen that I did this morning. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You could pull up the uh, Alabama thing. Well, again, if you <clears throat> go back to what Gary said before about like how people are squatting yeah, yeah. you know like people are kind of left to their own devices of squatting you know mm -hmm. you you played at a high level but you also played high school football where i'm sure everyone got all fired up and you benched yeah. and deadlifted and like intensity yeah lifted heavy and people are screaming and stuff and so that's definitely this kind of stuff that you want to avoid if you do run into a coach that knows how to mitigate some of it uh, I think there's partial range of motion kind of a la like joel seedman mm -hmm. uh, i also think that you could probably do a lot of different types of squats, as long as you're, I, I think it would be a good idea to practice on your toes. Yeah. We, I mean, we're, that's the other thing is like, we're still squatting. Right. Like that's, I don't, you know, and we're not squatting in the traditional sense of how we've accepted the squat in this, you know, environment where mm -hmm. we think of the squat, we think of it with a bar in our back. Yes. It's funny. I'll, we'll have kids that will assess and I'll be like, give me your best squat. They won't have a bar. They'll just put their hands there. Like, cause they're mm -hmm. so used to like, that's their squat. To yeah. Them. Whereas we're saying like, no, the squat was like a fact of life for the hunter gatherer. It was mm -hmm. how you got to the gathering portion, mm -hmm. the squat in the hinge where your static bow and corner, they were non-negotiable because you had to work on the ground. You had to yeah. get to the ground to do your work. Yeah. So that squat and that hinge pattern are so crucial to who <laughs> we are. So we do squat and we do hinge. <laughs> We just do them slightly different with mm -hmm. different setups so that we can keep, like you said, we can keep the foot control in our ankle bone high. We can keep it in the back chain and we can make sure that the ball and sockets are moving in the right way. So we're not saying don't squat. We're just saying the way you squat is crucial. And if you're a locomotive athlete, you're going to want to go to squat. But yeah, go ahead and, and run it. And 
you'll be able to see pretty clear when you get to the slow motion of, of what's going on here with these ACLs. And, and this is going to be the same <laughs> pattern. Go straight every in the time. ground. This is going to be the same pattern for an Achilles shred or for an ACL. And so what's happening in the ACL specifically is that tibia is going to get stuck. So now when the athlete goes to land and he what goes to pressurize. Biggest, what was his biggest mistake right there? Well, it's it's really that now you're working off of the inside of the foot. You know, you're you're now look at his shin and his thigh. They're they're at an angle where they're turned yeah. in. What should he have done potentially well, differently? There's nothing he could do. There's what he would have to do is he would have to have that foot not straighter purposely. and then he'd have to be inside ankle bone high. And when he goes to pressurize here and he foot, starts to pressurize his he would set a bow. Foot so, straighter. Yeah, and, foot and straighter. Landing on the toe. And, and like landing land, on and the toe. Get out of that heel. Yeah, yeah okay. get okay. out of that heel. So the heel is gonna lock you down. So now what you're seeing there on the release, see how his knee shoots out and his heel shoots in? So what's happening is is you're going to work the foot like a pivot point. So you're either going to be working off that outside corner as a pivot point, or you're going to be working off of the inside corner as a pivot point. So unfortunately, he's got the inside of his foot as the pivot point, which you can see right there. And you see how the sock line is, is dove down and in. But what's really happening in this moment right here is that his shin is turned inward. So the shin and the thigh are working. Remember that joystick analogy? Just picture the thigh and the shin for a second plugged into the foot. And so when the foot goes to the big toe and it goes to the heel and it goes to the inside of the foot, you've now taken that shin and that thigh and you've started them on a spiral inward. So you're loading a spiral inward as opposed to loading a spiral outward. The spiral outward would be the bow that's associated with inside ankle bone high, that's associated with the heel up. The spiral inward on the loading is associated with the lifting engine where now the inside of the foot is the main anchoring point. The heel is now down, the, the thigh and the shin are in, and now they've got to swing outward. They've got a corner outward as opposed to what should have been a corner inward. So now as he goes to corner outward, what's going to happen is his foot is going to essentially lock his shin inward, but his thigh is going to keep going outward. So that moment there that you mm. see what looks to be a drop, what's actually happened right there is his thigh is turned out and his shin is in. And he's so that lucky. sheer blew the knee. He's and kind then, of yeah. lucky that he didn't do it on the other side too. Well, yeah, I mean, that you know, when, when someone tears their ACL, unfortunately, you basically can flip a coin that they're going to either tear that knee again or the other knee mm. because there's just been no correction. And then when you see the foot come off the ground in that, in that example, you'll see the kneecap fly out, mm. right? So you'll see the kneecap fly out. And then when that happens, it's just, it's a, it's a bad situation. Don't tell me it happened here too. No, no so, so that, go, go to, to flash the two different pictures. This is one of our kids right here, Jalen McCleskey. His dad's a uh, DB coach, but if you could put them both up, I don't know if you could solve a side them, but um, put me to work here. Can, can, <laughs> is that possible? Oh, well, look out. at him. So all you got to do is scoot it over a little bit. Okay, that's two different landings. Mm, okay. Okay, so he's absorbing the pressure into that pad of the foot, the ball of the foot. He's taking that first lick into the heel. So think yeah. about what we've been talking about, about whenever that heel gets loaded and that talus goes down and then it gets stuck. Now he don't have the freedom to corner that hip. What will happen on this side, if I, if I had time and I would have thought about it, I could have threw the video together. But when he when his foot comes off the ground, his heel is free to float away from the body. So the shin and the thigh are able to stay in synchrony with each other and organized. What happens on the other one is, is when he pressurizes the hip, he's not going to be able to do that. The shin's going to get stuck and then the, the femur is going to go to open. Remember what we showed you guys yesterday when we were showing those kind of deep dives of uh, Ed Reed landing versus those that ACL shred. Mm -hmm. We just got to get that foot climbing high enough to keep the shin from locking. Like essentially, if you can just have that heel not being that huge anchor, and mm -hmm. even it doesn't, this is why we, like people will look at this and they'll be like, well, that doesn't look like the bow that I saw when somebody was running straight ahead. And that's because the bow is a behavior. It's just a spiral out as you load pressure into the system. That can happen from a matrix of steps, whether I'm stepping forward, stepping behind me, stepping out, wherever I want to put that foot in space, <clears throat> it may look a little different to your eye, but the behavior is still the same such that the inside of the foot is rising high mm. just to keep the ankle from being locked mm -hmm. down and in. If I can just keep that ankle from being locked, I'm not going to mm -hmm. create disharmony between either the heel and the tibia or the tibia and the thigh. And that's kind of the two it's big problems paper. that you're seeing. It's, it's just it's sheer. Yeah, it's disconnection. Yeah. And, and the, 
And like the we kid showed in the you backing now was disclaimer. The kid in the backing now was. The, the, and the, the toe. <laughs> 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 oh, man. And the, uh, I don't know who that is. And the, <laughs> the, the toe, it, it kind of seems like the toes could be pointed out slightly. Uh, as long as you're conscious of getting that ankle bone. Right. There's like a right. little wiggle room there. Yes. There's a little bit, right? We would say, I mean, ideally, once again, you're going off of ideals. So ideally, the best way to get the ankle to really turn down, back, and out is with a straight foot. That's what, you know, Storette was trying to get to with torque. Like, you got to keep the foot straight to really turn the shin bone out. It's the same thing with the joystick. <clears throat> that platform can't be moving. If you're trying to turn a joystick and the platform keeps going with it, you're not actually turning the joystick. So ideally, the second toe would be straight, and it would hold there, and then you would turn the shin bone out. Now, there's <clears throat> still some wiggle room if the big toe is straight. There's still a little bit of wiggle room. If the, but the more you start to play on that, mm -hmm. it gets really tough, and now you start to lose the ability to get that shin to open. So you'll see some what look to be slightly crooked foot where they can still climb the ankle bone high enough to set the bow, but it's not something that you want to live in. You really want your toe to be pointing in the direction you're going. So if I'm over here and I'm going to cut and I'm going to go that way, I want to almost point my foot. Like you saw Jalen's, his foot's pointing in the direction that he's going to break on his slant. So because my foot's almost going to land like it would look to be slightly pigeon-toed to somebody, it's only going in the direction that I'm trying to go towards or it's pointing in the direction. So when I land like that for my slant, my bow won't look the same as if somebody mm -hmm. was out the block sprinting. But the behavior will be the same because that foot can still rise high. The shin can open and then close back, and I'll just be, boom, like a missile coming right out of that that pivot point to where I want to go. And Jalen's a good example of um, – I think there's a lot of confusion with our program where people think because you train Goda that you're safe. Like Jalen was a kid that came in – his he has had – multiple, multiple hamstring issues in college. Like, tore both of them twice. Do you know why that happened? Well, he was super averted, super duck-footed, yeah, right? So he had a lot of this. That that route like that took three years to build, mm -hmm. like to get that foot like that. Even he 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 signed with uh, – he was with the Falcons. They released him. Um, he, so he's a, he's, a, he's a kid that came in not – you want to talk about weight gain with Gota? So so Jalen was a 4'3 kid when he came in. He had a 41-inch vertical, and he had an 11-foot broad jump before Gota, okay? <laughs> After Go but he was 168. Mm -hmm. So he goes to the Falcons. They tell him – they keep him, like, you know, the whole summer, and then they release him and say, well, you got to put some weight on. So he comes in. His dad hits me up. His dad's a college football coach. His dad's like, Gary, he needs to gain weight, but he's got these multiple hamstring issues and things like that. So he comes in, and I put on 18 pounds. I put 18 pounds on him Then within the next offseason. He ran 4-3-3. They let him do a combine again because it was a COVID year, mm -hmm. so they let them go do an actual in-person combine. He ran 4-3-3, 42-inch vertical, 12-and-a-half-foot broad jump, or 11-and-a-half-foot broad jump, something like that. So his numbers actually went up a little bit or, got, or stayed the same, mm -hmm. put on 18 pounds. But it took us, like, this is now two-and-a-half years or something like that. Now, he just got – he just played in the um that, uh, XF – no, the USFL. USFL. And now the Bears and the Saints are talking to him again. Mm -hmm. But when he was with the Saints the last time, he had tweaked the hamstring again. Now, he had a, a DB pressing down on his back. I'm not saying that because I don't think a muscular injury is a, is a, is a, is a, is a contact injury unless you get hit in a quad with a hammer or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but like, like a contusion or something, but that's not going to keep you out for five weeks or something like that. Do you have the other one that we had looked at with the other kid running the slant? With the foot where it was more I just crooked? want to point out something uh, same, as well. It's the same slant route, but it was just a different kid. Uh, the internet. So they could see the difference. <laughs> the internet's conjecture on stuff like this. You know, those comparison between those two two shots, uh, both those athletes are in completely different positions. You know, the yeah. the uh, the Alabama receiver, he's got so much of his body weight shifted over to one side where it's definitely a lot harder for him to shift back the other way. Um, and then right. that's a championship game versus practice. So there's mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. major differences going on. Not that I disagree with what you guys are saying. Yeah. I'm just no, saying there's always pull that other one up, pointing Andrew. out some different Tons variables. In yeah. comparison to Jalen's, <clears throat> not the uh, – I just sent to tell mm -hmm. you. Now, that the kid that was standing in the back that we kind of made the joke about, about that's not our kid. Now, watch how his feet affect his route. As Jalen stands pretty much with straight feet now. 
especially when he's in the gym. You could see his ankle with the heel in the ground right there, the Alabama guy. It's it's like got mm-hmm. an inward curvature. Like. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's interesting because the Alabama guy, like that cut, that might be effective. Like he might move very fast when he does that cut. I'm sure he's done it a, a bunch of times. Set up, we got a video of Randy Moss floating around somewhere where he does the same thing. Right. He catches a ball, gets twisted around like that, sticks the foot in the ground, but he sets a bow. Mm-hmm. And he don't, you know. So, but the the heel doesn't make contact with the ground when he no, sets it up. No, he holds the pressure into four through five or on the more the pad. See the difference in the foot. Yep. So the one Eight, kid's the yeah. Alabama kid. Now think about this. That is a that kid right there. Probably how many times can he do that before he actually tears something? Mm-hmm. Because the other thing is too is you are taking a duck foot inside ankle bone low and you're pressurizing that column and he has no bow behavior. Now I know it's a still pick. But like you could see, the knees already pointed out. Jalen's knee, his shin, his his thigh, and all of that's equal. So when that goes to set a bow, he's gonna set just enough bow to where he don't have no injury, and the energy's going to the outside. And then the shin and the quad could release together. Whereas the other kid's gonna be, he can't release. His foot's pointed outward, yeah, therefore gonna, a lot of the energy is gonna be gonna pushing that way. It's gonna suffocate the ankle, and that ankle is gonna get locked. Locked in place. Well, you did a great job with that one, Andrew. Yeah, there it is. I mean, it's just a little bit. Like, like, you just got to have the heel up enough to unlock that shin. You know, you got to have you got to have enough of that inside ankle bone, and that's as the as the pressure because the pressure it's all about where is the pressure, and so as the pressure is collecting into my column, and as it's it's sort of gathering into that space. I need to make sure that my foot is climbing inside ankle bone high as that pressure is getting there. That's going to give me that space to set the ankle and not get stuck, not get the ski boot effect or not have what you see on the right, which is now you can see like, yeah, that heel, I can see it on the backside. The heel gets stuck in. Mm -hmm. Jalen's is just up enough to let the shin open and and then close. And then you can see his hips sit back a little bit more. And so much of this this stems from your hips, right? Like Mm -hmm. the the way that you're moving your hips and that's the whole point Mm -hmm. and you guys – Having us do some of the groundwork and the the wall drills, um, the the drill on the wall where you go uh, with your you go bows and corners yep. back and forth, and yeah. you're really trying to twist those feet and trying to get the knees to point mm-hmm. at each other, right? Yeah, you're trying to get you know you're trying to almost you're taking that ball and socket of the hip and the ankle, and you're holding that foot straight, and you're kind of like the same way you'd break a paper clip going back and mm. forth. You're kind of doing that to the sticky glue that's in your capsules, you know. So you're gonna find as you go through these bows and corners, you're gonna like feel like you're just hitting old stuck stuff as you go. <laughs> like I remember, like man, like click, 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 pops and stuff. You're going through the mess. Mm. You're going through what's been holding you back. And so once you get real disciplined, you may you may not even have all of the bow or all of the corner to even get to. But the fact is, you're finally taking that that ball and socket in the capsule and you're starting to floss it through its proper range. If you're inner ankle bone high and your back chain dominant, you're going to essentially pin those ball and sockets onto a path that they have to work bow to corner. The same way that what happened to this young man was when he went inside ankle bone low front chain dominant, he pinned his shin and his thigh in a position where they had to go from a spiral in to a spiral out. Mm -hmm. So we touched on this a lot yesterday with you guys of this idea, this bigger picture concept of compression versus decompression, right? And that's really like the first thing that we try to get across to a client is, hey, we just assessed you. We just noted where all that compression was sitting. Well, now we've got to start the process of getting you decompressed. And getting you decompressed is not just a spinal thing. I think we look at the discs and we say, oh, get some space there. No, this is a pelvis, hip, shin, foot. The whole system needs to be decompressed. And if you're inside of that state of decompression, that's where the ball and socket has all of its space to open and close. When you start to live in a state of compression, that's when the musculoskeletal system either gets loaded against the grain where you're not loading tissue properly or you're starting to kind of log jam the bones. You know, you're starting to create shear moments at the shin and the foot. You're starting to create shear moments at the thigh and the shin. So if you can get somebody into a state of decompression, that's gonna give them the best chance to kind of open everything up and close it. That compression concept is already noted in other systems of the body. You go to a heart doctor, the cardiovascular system, things get clogged up, it's compressed. There's no space, there's no decompression, there's nowhere for the blood to flow. It could be talked about for the lymphatic system. You Mm -hmm. could say the same thing for the pulmonary system. Whenever something goes wrong in one of those systems of the body, it's centered around the concept that 
things are compressed, the flow of life, the flow is stopped, mm -hmm. and you've got to get that compression out of there. We're taking that same concept and we're applying it to just the musculoskeletal system. You need to keep that system decompressed. That's how it's built to work. That looks like this. Inner ankle bone high, back chain dominant, from bow to corner, all centered around this very simple concept of, like I said before, I'm at point A, I see something over there at point B I need to get, I go make this move. What is that move? That's Goda. And that yeah. is who you are. It's interwoven into the fabric of who you are. And when you're just in the wild, you're just in the Amazon, you don't have anything else to do besides gather food. That's it. It's all centered around walk, run, throw, swing, strike. And we were that much longer than we've been this. And since we've been this, we've been able to do cool shit. Like, hey, let's make an Olympic lift. Let's play football. Let's do, so, you know, let's let's sit in chairs. Let's mm -hmm. wear these shoes that, you know, tighten our... We can start creating all sorts of shit because we've got refrigerators and grocery stores. You know, like you don't have to wake up to go hunt. When you wake up to go hunt and there's an eight-hour hunt in front of them, there's not enough time to even get close to saturating the, the system in anything other than the walk, the run, the throw, the swing, and then sitting on the ground. It's just who you are. It's what you live in. Your environment wouldn't let anything else happen to it. What prevents, uh, so we're thinking with inside ankle bone high and then like the, um, like cornering correctly, the way you guys have been showing everybody. Um, cause the, before you guys came on, you know, I was thinking like, like in junior high school, like on the basketball team, kids will be rolling their ankles all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Now I, I understand that like, it's going to be very hard to do that if your mechanics are correct. But when I see the way, like, you know, being on the outside and then cutting, making cuts, mm -hmm. but nobody seems to be rolling, why, what's preventing that from happening? It's a great question. So if you look and you deep dive those ankle rolls that look like, boom, like huge outward movements, though those are linear movements. So that's going to be meaning that it's just the foot or the shin moving on like the frontal plane. Mm -hmm. So it's not truly inner ankle bone high where there's a spiral mechanism to the foot and a spiral uh, mechanism to the shin. And if you actually look at those heel, those, I just gave it away, they're heel strikes. So what happens is, let's say somebody's going to cut that way and they go to put the heel in the foot and then the momentum just shifts right. outward. They essentially go lateral as opposed to being out of the heel and then setting a spiral move. So now they go to hit their heel and the momentum just shifts them in a way that they just, <laughs> they roll right over that, that makes and they sense. just go yeah. straight linear. Mm -hmm. And then it just, it, it blows up it the ankle. Sense. Any linear move that gets put into the system is bad. It can't work. It has to work off of a multi-planar move. It has to, everything has to corner. Even when your foot builds inside ankle bone high, it's a spiraled half dome. There's like a little bit of spiral that takes place to set that stage. There's a spiral that takes place to set the ankle, the hip. Everything has this little move. It's nuanced and it's slightly, and it's very detailed and it's not as much as people think. And I've seen that happen with people looking at our stuff and then they get so engulfed in the spiral and it's probably some of our faults speaking on it but they twist too much mm -hmm. whereas if you focused more on just being in the state of decompression where your back chain dominant inside ankle bone high and then you just go ahead and get those bony landmarks to point you'll find that the bow is way more subtle than you thought it was mm -hmm. the corner is way more subtle it's not as much of this like big twist and big turn and big yeah. rotate it's just a certain math that you want to hit and when you hit that math you're like, oh, this shit feels loaded. Like I feel like a fucking loaded gun back here, where I can I can send something mm -hmm. in that direction. It loaded be, just enough to yeah, and, get the opposite reaction from the other side. Right. We just always right. you're always chasing suppleness, right? You're always trying to create more and more access so you could set a bigger and stronger bow. It's kind of like y'all, y'all probably a tight muscle. You can't make it as strong as you could a longer. You, you know, a, a lengthened out muscle. You would stretch before you try to strengthen, you know, a muscle. It's the same thing. Like, we need space in those joint capsules to be able to set that big bow. So, in the beginning, when you're just getting in the goda, what will happen is, is because you see it on a – like, I try, I try to tell all, the, all of the coaches, like, post your results. Try not to post your workouts because where you start may not be where you start. So you seeing a bow set for, for Mark may be different than the bow that you're going to set because you may have more access into the back chain. That's going to determine that. So when you see somebody trying to do what you did, y'all both trying to do the same thing, they'll compensate with the head or something like that. They'll push that. They'll spin the heel in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. The ankle, the big toe will come off the ground and stuff like that. So the, the, the key to developing 
in the movement is to create more and more access, but work inside of where you're at and don't try to compare it to a Ed Reed off the top. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, I wish that we could figure out how much is too much that fucks up the pattern. <laughs> uh, you yeah, know, what's I'll, that I'll, input number? I'll, I'll, what's yeah. the, the dosage? Yeah, you know? yeah. 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 Because when I think about it, I totally get let's like let's think football and a lot of sports when an athlete gets into the gym an athlete wants to push that's the thing mm -hmm. athletes want to do you want to fucking push so you get into a gym and you're given these movements to do it's not your instinct to be like okay let me try to do this with as great movement quality as possible mm -hmm. the instinct is let me try to load the bar as right. much as i can so i can get stronger get and that bigger. number up right. right get that number up that arbitrary number yep. on this bar up and then over time it's like you know, well how do i how do i get bigger how do i get stronger you put more and more and more on okay we already know how that can fuck things up because mm -hmm. you don't need to be able to squat 405 to be a great football player mm -hmm. like you don't have to it it'll show that you're that strong but th that doesn't mean it necessarily transfers to the field mm -hmm. so the first thing is we need to back off of the mindset of more on the bar is always better right. and potentially changing movement quality but let's think like okay well if we can fuck that intensity shit and just make sure that we can get an aspect of this to maybe help an athlete get bigger then on the other side of it what are the what are ways that maybe you guys which you guys have already adjusted movements you are doing mm -hmm. types of squats i know you mentioned you don't pick up anything from the ground but that's not necessarily problematic but like if a coach is listening to this and they do work with athletes and they are thinking to themselves well i don't think i need to get rid of the barbell but th th I think there are ways, because Cal Dietz has done this in a way, and I, I know we talked about him earlier, where he just doesn't have his athletes do things with their heels on the ground. Right. Right? Like, they'll have a staggered stance, and they'll be <clears> squatting <throat> staggered stance with a bar on the back, which I know you guys do disagree with. Mm -hmm. But at least they're not getting that heel on the ground and planted mm -hmm. and having the athlete continue to do those things. Yeah. And I just think there are, if someone wants to fuck with this, because I know you guys have made a system You've already made a mm -hmm. system where you've thought of weight. You, you've, you, the things you do, athletes can get bigger. Like mm -hmm. I did some stuff with you. I'm like, oh wow, there's there's some resistance element. In it. There's yeah. progression. Yeah. There's a lot of volume. So a muscle will get bigger with that stimulus. The mm -hmm. stimulus doesn't have to be the deadlift, the squat, these movements. There's a lot of ways to achieve that stimulus. But then it gets me thinking. Okay, can I take that and do that with a squat, but maybe staggered stance? If I really wanted to squat and put a bar on my back, could I get that kind of benefit but not load it too heavy? I think there are some things people can do as long as they can stay away from trying to hype up the intensity, meaning the load on the bar or the weight that you're doing, um, and removing the heels from the equation and trying to emulate what you guys are talking about, about the bow in the corner. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might depend too on like the kind of athlete. Of yeah, course. Right, right. Like, like maybe you can do it, but maybe I shouldn't. You know, you move better than I do, you know, at the moment. So maybe you can have more freedom with that because you already move better. Uh, yeah. And then it's like, well, Mark, why are you still doing those same old movements? You're going to still move the mm -hmm. same. Your good behavior mm -hmm. is going to be the same as these movements that you ingrained. So I think some of this is like uh, you must kind of unlearn what you learned, mm -hmm. kind of Yoda style. Yes. A and for, <laughs> so, <clears throat> for some of us who's, who have done it for so long or so much or had so much volume, so much weight, uh, maybe it is time to decompress and to really, um, yeah. to really back way off. And, yeah. and also, like, why, why not also, uh, if you really love these movements and they really are connected to uh, a, a kind of a lift through it mentality, right. where like lifting is a, a huge part of your life. Mm -hmm. Maybe it helped you with addiction or breakups or yeah. whatever it helped you with. Then I don't see any reason why you can't keep some of the movements in. Maybe they're just done lighter. Maybe they're done a mm -hmm. different right. way. You know, things like that. Oh, I I always say, man, if you if you do love you lifting yeah. and you you're in a, you know you're a, you guys are adults, do what you want. Like yeah. we're never saying to to people like you and in, in what you guys do here um, to stop doing what you love. We're just coming in and saying, look, this is how the humans designed to work. Y'all are humans. This is what you want to pay homage to first, and then go ahead and do what you love. The athlete, their goal isn't to lift. Yeah. That's where the difference is. They're, that's yeah. not their game. Whereas someone, that guy you mentioned, that's their life. Like right. that's their game. That's the four quarters for them. They live for that moment. I get that. And I understand people want that. And there is a way to modify a lot of those things. And, you know, we could nuance the detail of being in a lunge with a bar on your back and how that locks the spine, doesn't let your head get over and all that. Yeah. But if, if you're someone that loves that move and you want to do it and you lift the heels up, 
that's better than the heels being down. I guess if you're going to really talk about, you know, the difference between it, it would be better than if you were just sloppily yeah. heels down. It, but for that athlete, his goal is to score a touchdown. Yeah. His goal is to, is to score the goal in soccer or to, to, you know what I mean? Throw the, the 98 mile an hour fastball. So their goals are locomotive athletic movement goals. And that's why we say there is a ideal when it comes to crossing the white lines and what takes place inside that locomotive arena, just like there would be an ideal when you step into the weight room to move heavy weight, like Louis Simmons had you guys doing. There's, there's just, you just have different goals. Yeah, and you have to know what your goals are, know what you're going to be doing, and you got to know what's going to pay you or what's mm -hmm. going to be that sort of thing that makes you tick. And if you're that person that's crossing white lines to go play sports for four quarters over a season long, you got to know that. The best ability is availability. And mm -hmm. they say it all the time, and I said it in the beginning, but I'll say it again because that is number one for you. Whereas the person that, like, dude, I'm a weekend warrior. This lifting is getting me through an emotional time in my life. You're not even in the same world. They're not even the same goals. Uh, they yeah. can be treated differently, but everybody can still benefit from go to. The, the, the thing, too, with, like, the stagger stance stuff and things like that, one thing, like, with Cal was, I'm sure one day he was, like, we don't play with our heels on the ground. Let's get them out. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? So it was a common sense move. Like, uh, and, and listen, and when you look at a lot of programs and stuff, when you apply common sense to it, it's like, wait a minute, some of that stuff don't make sense. The problem with putting a bar on the back and a stagger stance is, is when you look at somebody that plays in a stagger stance, like a basketball player, he's not playing – his intention is not to play this like up the court in a stagger stance in the defensive position. His feet should be straight to the sideline more because he's trying to force that guy to go to a side. So there's a strategy involved in basketball with the offset stance, but it's still bilateral. Mm -hmm. It's not staggered from a moving forward position. If I'm a stagger going forward, then I need to have a head in the column because you got to put the rotation in any stagger stance. Rotation. That's where the failure was. That's where the 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 it went wrong, right? Is because if I go stagger stance and I go here, now I'm locking my spine up. Mm -hmm. And I can't take a bar and turn or twist because I can't load the column. So see if you can, see if you can bring up the video, he, he has me do them. I'm kind of curious now. I, I don't remember if he oh, had us. Because yeah. I know he had, like, we had our arms out, like I was holding on to something. Mm -hmm. On your and Instagram? I, and I don't remember. Uh, no, no, it's on YouTube. Oh, my bad. Yeah, the thing with Cal, it. right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just curious yeah. on, on the execution of it, but you're probably yeah. correct. It's like, that's a that's a good, like, starting point. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. let's get the heel out of the ground. Let's get the foot straight. But then as you work up the other super important details that are in the whole system playing out, you'll note, like, well, I need to get my head into the column. I need to get my spine to work. And that's where, well, the bar kind of traps you. Now, we were using the safety bar way back when inside of our chuck squat yeah. world. But what we found was even more was, was was a better advantage for our athletes was just taking a plate and squeezing it to the chest was a way for us to kind of recruit the backside and still get the turns that we needed. So we had ways to kind of add weight and not sort of lose the math. See, like when the yeah, you're right, straight up and down. Yeah, right, like right. the the head gets locked in. That's the only thing that we say. And then like you know, you look at the knee; it's still pointing straight. We want the kneecap. To point out, we want to feed the we want to feed the rotary aspect of the ball and sockets. Mm -hmm. Like we just want to pay homage to how those 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 cats need to but, move bilaterally. Like it's probably with a safety ball. The concept that I used in the beginning was is if I'm gonna be in a bilateral setting, safety ball makes more sense because I could put the arms here. I could kind of move the arms forwards and backwards like I want to, and I could kind of get the butt back. But right here, see that's the shin angle thing. I mean that's not. That's not really what's happening. You could get stronger like that, no doubt. You know, but I, I wouldn't. I would. I would have the knee setting out, and I would want your head to load that column because the head could dictate the behavior of the bow. Mm -hmm. Because if the head stays in the middle, and the and the, and the, something's got to counter it, right? Mm -hmm. So when we talk arms, like like if we get into the arms, the arms, the purpose of the arms is a tool, right? So if if we was like um, uh, barefoot runner said it yesterday, Graham said it yesterday, 
Well, we was made to carry something when we ran because we would sprint with a spear or we would have a rock or something like that or we would carry something, right? So we would have to use whatever's in our hands as a counter, which in turn would mean that when we have nothing in our hands, the arms are used strictly for balance purposes. So if you're loading the body properly, then the arms should always work in a similar place side to side. Then when you go into the... um. If you, if you go into like where you, your head's not loading properly, then you're going to use the arm to counter the weight, right? Mm -hmm. The same way that you would use that tool to counter something, or, and you might adjust the way your head is depending upon if you was carrying something. Because when you land in that column in the split stance, everything's got to load into that one side for the most efficient movement and to load it properly. That's why we go back to the whole thing of we don't slam force into the ground. We load force into a bow. We absorb absorb force. We absorb the energy and then we, we release it on the, the heal away is the release of the energy. And it's also the harmony. And that's the other thing. Like that's where like where my, where my eyes go is I'm looking at not just the foot complex, but I'm all the way upstream to all the ball and sockets. And that works out all the way into the hands, mm -hmm. into where the wrist is going. So it's 22-5, but it's 22-5 throughout the whole system. So if that foot holds straight, and then I always tell people, look at it this way. Just imagine this. First off, think with your skeleton. It, it cleans everything up because everybody can visualize a skeleton right now when I say it. Even my seven-year-old kid knows it because they watch, they've gone through a Halloween of their life, right? You've seen a skeleton. You have that image in your mind. So just picture the feet sitting there, just the feet. And now they got that open space that you saw. And if you could pull that photo back up, Andrew, of that open space at the top of the foot. Now just picture me holding the skeleton, the rest of it. And I just plug it into the foot. Well, the whole column, the whole skeleton needs to work that rotary aspect. So if the shin's going to work the 22.5, then the thigh's got to match it. The pelvis has to move a little bit. The spine's got to move a little bit. The bicep bone, the forearm, everything's got to move just enough to work together. I can't have my shin going too far out and my spine being stuck in. That's going to create a linear move. It's going to create some sort of imbalance, some sort of compensation. So it's more about getting everything just to harmonize together. And when we noticed that, when we were looking at the landings, we're like, man, their head gets into the column. Why is their head getting into the column? Well, everything is opening up. The whole column is opening up and the tracking system just sits steady over the top. And it really sits steady as you bow and as you corner. And then when you release and reset, the tracking system goes over here. And so the head being in the column is crucial because like Gary said, it's part of what's letting the whole column harmonize. And when you get into a unilateral setup, you're really, if you're in a split stance, you're trying to load one side of the body. Yeah. So you're trying to load one column. Whereas when you're bilateral and you're in your like normal squat, you're loading 50-50. But the second that I go split stance or I want to go from side to side, I'm now loading 100% into one foot and then boom, releasing over to the other foot. That's where it gets tricky because you want to make sure that everything opens together and you don't leave a piece behind. Mm. One thing, Mark, and I, I, I don't have the video. Well, I mean, I have it, but it ain't for me to show right now. But one thing that I was telling you the other day, whenever we was working and I was telling you how when you was going into your column, like you're starting to move into the column more, the head's kind of starting to move like you're getting it's getting detached from the it's not like compressed like it was. You could tell you've mm. been doing some things to lengthen the spine and release that compression. And I think a lot of the programs that you're looking at right now, like FP, wh whether we agree on the spine or not, the the decompression part of it is crucial. Like that's got to happen, right? It, and and just like Rick was saying earlier, when you compress the organs and things like that, they subject to failure quicker than if they was open. So the decompression part, but when you start to get this, this starts to happen, then we know that you're starting to make progress because mm. you could see it. Because your first one was like just <laughs> tilting everything. Right. Yeah, like that. So yeah. I think uh, something for coaches and athletes to just try would be add in some groundwork. Mm -hmm. And there's it's reasonable for uh, uh, an athlete or a coach to have, have some time where they back away from a particular lift. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's just hypothetically say, ditch your deadlift for a little while, a couple weeks. You're not a power lifter. You're an athlete. And maybe maybe it's a coach setting up a program. Just just ditch that. Add in some of the groundwork, some of the stuff that we're talking about today, and just see how your players do from it. Mm -hmm. Do people yeah. feel better? Do they feel worse? Do Many they feel time. faster? 
Right, give test it, a little, it out. Yeah, give it a little bit of time and see how it goes. Yeah, mm -hmm. we always say like, no matter if you're, we were talking about this, about if you're gen pop, if you're a power lifter, Olympic lifter, pro athlete, pro NFL player, if you just did these three things, we've already talked about two of them, we've kind of mentioned the third, but the first one, your walk, right? Walking better. You're gonna get thousands and thousands of reps if you walk better. The second one was the rest. The third one would be just adding that ground wall work, that that recode regimen. We call it movement hygiene, essentially. It's the brushing the teeth of the musculoskeletal system. It's the, can you give me 20 minutes a day? Can you give me 10 minutes in the morning? Can you give me 10 minutes at night with this simple go-to routine? All you need is a ground and a wall, right? Can you give me those 20 minutes and then maybe for a bonus somewhere in the middle of the day, maybe before you're gonna go do something dynamic or after you've had a long sitting marathon, you give me another 10, another 10 minutes. So maybe at most I'm asking of everybody 30 minutes of specific go to training and then just taking that walk and rest because you know it's gonna be the other 90% of your day and being aware of what you're doing in that walk and rest. You're not gonna get every single rep, but you're aware of it. And like I said, when you have that connection where your brain goes, oops, I'm in WOTA, that's good. Because now you're getting one more input to tip the scales, to start to move your brain to, this is comfortable, I like this, I want to be GOTA, I wanna do that. Just like your body got comfortable in WOTA. Because it's not gonna just auto-correct you. It's gonna do what you tell it to do, and it's gonna eventually go into whatever behavior you have it in. So if you're, listening to this, no matter where you are in your life or what you're doing, if you just put those three things into your life, and even if you kept doing what you were doing, if you walked better, <clears> rested <throat> better, and added a little bit of groundwork and wall work, I guarantee that whatever you're doing is gonna get better. Even if it was powerlifting, or if you're a pro mm -hmm. athlete running around on a football field. And it's definitely time stamped right now. I really want people to pay attention to the aspect of the way you walk, um, especially lifters, because if, if some of you guys probably pay attention to the way you stand or the way you walk, your feet are out here, mm -hmm. right? If you start paying attention to it and you just try to try to get those steps in and we have a timestamp somewhere of how you talked about the weight distribution in the foot, and how the feet should be facing forward, you can make a lot of change very quickly just, straighten them up, yeah. just, just trying mm -hmm. to straighten that up. Obviously, mm -hmm. the warm up that you guys do, and I'm pretty sure there's a YouTube video of the go to warm up on the channel now. Mm -hmm. Like that warm up is really beneficial in terms of loosening up those ankles. Mm -hmm. But if you pay attention to the way you walk and you just try to shift it as uncomfortable it may, as it may feel, it'll change. And the reason why I'm saying this is because as we started focusing on feet, and especially as I started like focusing on my feet and changing things up and changing the way I walk and move, number one, my arches are higher, mm -hmm. right? I'm not flat footed anymore because that was a stamp that I had. Mm -hmm. But there's so much more activity going on in those areas just because I've been being aware of the way that I move outside of the gym. Right. So like if you are someone who's competing in powerlifting and you cannot get, let go of these specific movements, these are things that you have to do um, or these are things that you just like to do even if yeah. you're not competing outside of it, those small changes can make all the difference for mm -hmm. you as a mover and just a human being. Yeah, it's the 90%. Mm -hmm. I mean, people talk about getting better and, and you know conquer the day and I'm super folk. What about the 90%? You know, No matter what you do, the training's always gonna fall on that 10%. Mm -hmm. There's always gonna be way more time that you're spending in your walk and your resting world. So it's like, if you really wanna maximize your performance, it means you wanna maximize being a human to the fullest extent of whatever that may be. It could be diet, it could be sleep, it could be recovery model, uh, uh, models, or it could be how you're walking and how you're resting. Mm -hmm. So that's that 90% that every human, every athlete can really tap into, and athletes haven't really known to tap into that. Nobody was telling us like, dude, you're gonna get a bunch of walking reps and they're gonna be important to how you play on Sunday oh, or yeah. Saturday. If yeah. you would have known that, you would. if you're looking to get better as a young soccer player, you'll, you'll do it. Mm -hmm. If somebody tells you, dude, if you rest on the ground, you'll be better at soccer, you would have done it. Oh, yeah. So if you just know those things, same thing could be for a powerlifter. Hey man, if you get back to the ground a little bit in the Seiza, that back that starts to mm -hmm. flare up kind of halfway through your week, it won't flare up halfway through your week. Mm -hmm. You'll get through your week and you'll get all your lifts and you'll be able to get through that plateau. So try to capture the 90% because everybody's so, you know, they're die, we're, we're diving into the 10. The everybody's yeah. looking at it and they're, they're hyper analyzing. I'm like, guys, there's a whole 90% over here that no one's really capturing. And if we can just do these simple things, start slow and let it build, you'll have a positive effect overall, not just on your musculoskeletal system, but on the whole system as how it's operating in its day-to-day, -day, the energy levels, how you feel, your you know social well-being, your emotional. Pain is a hindrance to performance. 
Performance could be having a conversation. It could be going down to get paper out of the um, to get the paper out of the uh, mailbox, or it could be trying to fly around on a football field. But when pain enters in, you're in trouble. Mm. You know, it's the same like the Aleve or Advil <clears throat> commercials. It's just a mother going to work. It's like that's not you know trying to score touchdowns on Sunday night, but it's still performance. You need to be there. You need to be present. You're not going to be present in the flow state if you're thinking about pain. So try to get that pain out, and the best way to get that pain out is to decompress the system. The best way to decompress the system is to be GOTA. You can capture a lot of that in the 90%. Mm -hmm. if, if you could help a, a professional athlete feel better, <laughs> we could help a dad that just wants to go <laughs> oh, watch yeah. so much right. a baseball yeah. game. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Much. So mm -hmm. it, it's kind of, when you think about it in theory like that. And uh, I will add in, I know I've mentioned it before, but uh, for me, shifting out of my former like footwear has allowed my feet to be oh, more yeah. aware of what's going on. I know we've just been badgering the <clears> listeners <throat> with like fucking change your footwear yeah. or barefoot yeah. or just get any type of pair of fucking barefoot shoes. Just mm -hmm. change that shit. It is, I personally think it's a big deal. There are a lot of people who are like, that shit's overrated. It doesn't mm -hmm. make a big difference. Mm -hmm. But the way my fucking footprints changed with the way 100%. the tendons, yeah. the tendons in my feet are fucking thicker. You cannot like, tighten down <clears throat> that toe box. You just can't do it. Yeah. yeah. You got to find a shoe that lets your toe box open. We, yeah. we saying it. There is a platform that has a design pattern and a shoe can obstruct it's, that. It's Dude, suffocating. Listen, we, we say it all the time. My kid has Jordans. Certain <laughs> pairs of Jordans are no good. If you're going to wear Jordans, wear the ones. Which Jordans do you wear? The ones are money. Like the 11s and things yeah. like that. We yeah. start to get into this narrower base or whatever. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, we all guilty of it. You, you, you put aesthetic value in front. I mean, that's why... A lot of people do work out is because they want to look good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, what comes along with it. Some people except when you're twenty five years old, a little knee pain every now and then ain't no big deal. But when you <laughs> go to the beach, yeah, you know what I'm saying, and you look great. But when you're fifty five, you might want to put some goat <laughs> up in there. Here's yeah. the other thing for the for the mental issue. Even if you're like skeptical, like somebody might be skeptical, try it out. Cause once you feel what it's like to open mm -hmm. the toe box, you ain't going back. Yeah. Like I go try to stuff my feet into a dress shoe, I'm like how did I wear this <laughs> yeah. five years ago? Like this was not uncomfortable five mm. years ago. And that's scary because that means that my nervous system was okay being in that position because mm -hmm. it had been coded that way. Once I switched to a minimalist shoe and I'm not, I don't wear like a zero or a vivo or anything like full tilt, but I make sure everything has a wide enough toe box. Mm -hmm. so yeah, my yeah. toe the box, you're wearing right they're now, just too. Jordan ones, they're mm -hmm. golf shoe. But if I have a wide enough toe box for your foot, so whatever your foot is, if you put your foot in a shoe, you could be at Famous Footwear. If you put your foot in a shoe and you got a wide enough toe box, that's a check. Meaning, can you splay your foot? Can you take your toes and try to open them and not feel like they're crunched inside of the shoe? Yeah. The next two pieces that are inside that minimalist footwear that you'd want to have to check the boxes would be no arch support and then zero drop. So that's what's making a shoe a minimalist. The arch support one, you can kind of get away with because you're the arch. You already have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need the arch support. You are the arch support. Yeah. You need to be holding inner ankle bone high. The arch support is essentially a sofa. Especially it if you're walking you, the right way. If like you're walking the right about, way, you yeah. won't even use it. So it, you can kind of get away with that one being in a shoe. Mm -hmm. The heel is one where it's like, there's a little level there where you can get away with some heel lift and you won't feel too out of your element go to, but there's a couple where you're like, you can't, that one's yeah. going to be too much. That's going to be too much heel lift. It's going to make you feel weird. It's going to start to push your hips forward. Mm -hmm. But if you can kind of find a shoe that at least gets close to checking two of those three boxes, two and a half, um, that's going to make you feel a lot better at the foot level. Well, and you'd be surprised. There's, there's more fashion shoes that yeah. are, that are Buy minimalist than, than you yeah. think. You just got to yeah. go look around you, and you, that you, market's going to, you get look at Gra like Graham's program. He has a lot of success with people because he gets them barefooted, mm -hmm. like getting back to being barefooted wakes the foot back up. It's, you know, he, everybody, I don't think there's a, a trainer or a system in the world that would tell you not to have an arch. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, some people have come out and said, Usain Bolt had no arts. Well, he also tore his left hamstring, too. But but he it, did, it, though. It, if you look at the photos, like, it's, th it's yeah, there. It's, you know, it's, it's not – everybody's not going to have the exact same – yeah. Physiology as yeah. how it looks. Mm -hmm. Like it's not, but the behavior is such that it's playing high enough to be inside that that bone corner behavior. Yeah. What about toe spreaders? 
Yeah. You got to have them. Yeah, they're the great. They, they, they'll passively, they'll relax. So so think about any other part of the body where you was talking about your shoulder, like like you protect your shoulder, right? Mm -hmm. If you got some, some heel problems or ankle problems or something, you could use the, I know that when, if something's not right, this is a this is something that you do like to protect, right? So you kind of close the shoulder up. Same thing could happen in the foot. When you put them toe spaces on and relax, they'll just get in there and start everything will just start to it'll get its chance to relax by spacing it out. It gives it gives it it relieves the compression. Absolutely wear them. We put them on our athletes while they're doing their groundwork and all in the gym. I don't have too many, unless we're sprinting or doing something multi-directional in the gym. My guys are pretty much barefooted yeah, on their socks. Barefoot. There we go. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And then, is there any certain brands that you guys recommend? We got them on. They about to go up on the Go to Shop. Yeah, you can get. I'm about to put a, a name on them. Go to Toes. Go to Toes. Go to Toes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think they're all. They're probably all similar in yeah, a yeah. sense. Like it's that kind Dude, of. Then you get them ten rubber. bucks on Amazon. Yeah. Bro. That's what I think we're gonna sell out for ten dollars. Nice. And you add that with, you know, the awareness at the foot level. That's mm -hmm. the other part with the minimalist thing that and Vibram got sued for this because they were telling people, put on the shoes and just go run around and oh, you're gonna get God. better. It's like, well, if you're Woda and you just <laughs> put yourself in that and you keep behaving Woda, that's like throwing the accelerant on the fire, right? So that's yeah. only gonna make it worse. So there has to be sort of a behavior change or a little mm -hmm. more awareness to when you interject that shoe into your life. And then the other part of it is you're not walking on soft pack mud. You're not walking on grass. You're walking on sidewalks. Okay. You're walking on mm -hmm. tile. You're walking on hardwood floors. You're in a man-made surface, right? So just be aware that like, it's okay to have a little cushion there. Cushion isn't necessarily the devil here when it comes to the foot when it comes to the shoe. You almost kind of need a little bit at times when you're in these sort of, I'm working on hardwood, yeah, I'm working on concrete. play on natural service. Because you'll have people, they'll go barefoot too early, too soon, as they're either recoding or starting their barefoot journey, and they'll be doing it like on a hard surface. And they'll be like, dude, my outside of my toes, I'm like, are you wearing Vivos? Like, yeah, I'm like, well, think about it. Like, your foot's not ready for that yet. I'm not yeah. saying you can't acclimate to that and that you shouldn't work towards it, but just be cautious early on when you do switch to that minimalist shoe. It's okay to like wear it for a few hours, take it off, and maybe go switch back to something that was a little mm -hmm. more comfortable. And then as you get through it, you'll just be like, dude, I feel like I could walk around barefoot on a harder surface and I don't feel bothered by it. You will get to that point, but just don't rush into it. Pat Brock, you found me. I hope you guys are enjoying this episode. Now I want to talk to you guys about three things that have vastly improved our sleep because you guys know how f***ing important that is at this point. <laughs> uh, the first thing are the blue light blocking glasses from Bond Charge because they help you start producing the melatonin you need to produce before you go to sleep. Secondly, the blue light blocking bulbs, because then you can replace the lights in your bathroom, in your bedroom, the places that you frequent at night, so that when you gotta turn on the lights, go peep or poo, <laughs> you're not bathed in an artificial light. And then the last thing are the sleep masks, so that when you are sleeping, you are covered in the dark mm -hmm. of night. Andrew, how can they get it? Yeah, you guys gotta head over to bondcharge.com. That's B-O-N charge.com slash power project. And at checkout, enter promo code power project to save 20% off your entire order links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes let's get back to the podcast yeah what's the deal with some uh wider cleats i think you were mentioning it too yeah, young they, athlete they got a, wish um, they did. Yeah. no they got them now you could they custom made though they're like 800 bucks <sighs> um <laughs> what wait up i could tell you the name Shit, of the it might be worth it though for someone to not <laughs> well, have if you're a pro athlete, agree, right? if you already if yeah, you're not if you're growing athlete, yeah if you a dad yeah, that's got right. a kid that's 12 you might buy like six of them that's in a right year. But I mean, no, that shit would be, that shit would have been great when I played soccer because oh, I had foot surgery yeah. because my shit was way too, like all my cleats were too narrow and I had a really wide foot. Well, there's not one soccer cleat that you could even buy. Can mm -hmm. you, I mean, can mm -hmm. you think of a soccer cleat that's not putting the toes like that? Yeah, actually. Is there a couple out there? The the brand that I would always gravitate to were the Adidas Copas, okay. specifically the Copas because they made a wide version of that shoe. Uh, but even okay. the wide version of the Copas weren't they weren't wide enough they weren't for like my wide foot. Enough, right. But for most for most that would actually if you're a wide foot guy, those yeah. were good shoes. But we most would, most cleats like especially Nike, Mercurials, yes. all of those cleats, the Vapors, they mm. look they look so good in their narrow the shit. The football world started designing their cleats sort of like a soccer cleat because like a speed oh. speed concept yeah so the yeah. the speed tds came out and they looked dope so everybody started wearing them and they would do this to the toes like even more so than a cleat already does mm -hmm. and you notice like the foot starting to get more crooked it's the same problem i think you see in the track world if everybody's if you're 
toe is getting pushed this way, it's not comfortable to keep your foot straight because now your big toe is like running into the shoe. Mm -hmm. So it's easier just to open up the foot and it feels more comfortable on that big toe. Yeah. Well, that starts to lead to a bunch of problems that are down the road. It's comfortable for the short term, but it's not good for the long term. Yeah. We would have guys that would actually cut a little X on the big toe at the top of the shoe just to give the big toe a little room to breathe. So they actually cut into the fabric just to let that big toe have a little more space because the shoes were so narrow. Mm -hmm. But if somebody, whoever's out there listening that designed shoes, I know there's a guy. Ones. They got ones. Yeah, they have ones. Yeah. So you could wear the ones. That's probably a better idea is wear the ones. But once again, if you're trying on cleats, man, look around and don't settle for something that's going to suffocate the toe box because it's going to have an effect. It's yeah. going to start to make that foot go a little crooked. The thing you said though about like how you couldn't necessarily foot fit your foot into other shoes after you you became more yeah. aware that should happen to me too because right. like as I was doing more barefoot stuff and then wearing barefoot shoes when I would put my feet back into other shoes that I had it was legitimately painful yes. because now my like my brain was aware right. of what the fuck's going on with my foot and I'm like oh shit I can't stay in this shoe for more than thirty minutes I right. ha I have it's to like get the fuck out bigger. of it, it not yeah. has to yeah it does. yeah it did it did, it did. dude it did. that's it what did. trips me out when I see like Zion and all of that like they show mm -hmm. his body now I'm like it still got the same foot and ankle mm -hmm. it right. didn't change yeah you, you know mm -hmm. you get but you you probably feel a lot better you, you know oh, what I'm saying yeah. like you, you, the platform's bigger it's 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 stronger it supports you more mm -hmm. I mean you're not small it you, proves you know what I'm that saying? you can change behavior. It yes. proves yeah. that you can change. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just another example of, because we have people that, well, you can't change foot and ankle behavior. What? Like, then what's the point of doing anything? If you can't change things, then why? why just, just just go. Just do whatever it is that, you know, don't even lift the weight. Don't, don't work out. Don't change anything because you can't affect. That's It's nonsense. So the same idea goes for that barefoot stuff. It's a perfect example of you put that minimalist shoe on and you wear it long enough mm -hmm. and you go back, you've made a change. Something has changed inside of that nervous system where it's like, whoa, 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 I'm now comfortable in this, or at least shows you that inputs are going to create comfort. Mm -hmm. And the comfort could be good or bad. Like we said, the nervous system is a servant to the environment. We've said that a gazillion times because it's true. And it's not that that could be good or bad. That could be a situation where you're getting used to crooked foot and then you put it straight and you're like, that feels terrible. Well, what feels terrible right now is actually good. That's where like people's brains get tripped up on this. Is they're like, yeah, but it doesn't feel good. Well, yeah, right now it doesn't feel good. We've also had people that their field trainers are doing you know, the cutting and stuff, and there's somebody that's had an Achilles shred or they've blown an ACL, but they're teaching people how to cut on the field and they're Same older way. now. And they're like, they're arguing with me and they're like, well, I don't understand how you could possibly cut off the outside edge. I'm like, exactly. Your brain doesn't understand because you're inside ankle bone low. It's become so comfortable to you that your brain does not want to go the other way because it's just going to be a servant to the environment that you created. But the same way that that has become comfortable, you could switch it to be inside ankle bone high setting a bow and that could eventually be comfortable. You just got to tip the scales. Wherever you're at in this process of being a WOTA or a GOTA, wherever you find yourself, that's what the assessment shows you. Mm -hmm. Here you are. This is you. This is your theme. You can't hide on that assessment. We're gonna find out what you're doing wrong. You're gonna note it, you're gonna become aware of it, and now you're gonna start the trek, and you're gonna work back towards that ideal, and you're gonna to start to tip the scales. The way you tip the scales is by saturating the nervous system. You gotta put the inputs in. It's like anything else. You wanna be good at something, you gotta rep it out. If you wanna be changing the movement pattern, you wanna get that pattern to look better and move, and move well, then you have to go ahead and you have to tip the scales, you have to put the inputs in. That's why that sort of cocktail or that recipe of changing your walk, changing your rest and getting a little regimen in, that's a way to tip the scales. Cause now you're talking about a lot of reps throughout your day that are starting to move you closer to Gota. And these inputs need to be integrated into high speed stuff as Eventually, well. Like, yeah. um, you know, you see football players doing these agility drills and, and ladders and stuff. And that could be, I'm sure that could uh, it could have be a, done good or bad. Yeah, yeah. One yeah. Of it could place. be good or bad. But yeah. I think a lot of times people are just in such a rush to do the drill. Oh yeah, because you got player after player, and you're trying to keep up with the running backs or the mm -hmm. linebackers or whatever group you're in. Dude, you're that, trying that, to be the fastest, so you go through it in a sloppy way, right? That training yeah. shit, the the field work stuff is not even built off a of, um, 
substance or what's good. It's built off of who's popular and where the smoke and mirrors are at. I mean, some of that, it, it, not some of it, it's pretty much all terrible. Really? Be, yeah. Like ladder work and stuff? No, 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 not the ladder work. I'm saying not like even some of these big the time field not work even the guys cut, or whatever. Just like, you, just, you just seen C.D. Lamb. You seen a bunch of these guys that Kyle was all Pitts at the same decoded. place. Kyle Pitts. They all working with the same people. Mm -hmm. And what happens is, is they do, they got into this thing where it's this wiggle thing or whatever and they trying to do all of this. Well, they're not respect and how the foot is supposed to, you could take the video of them training and put it side by side with that kid's ACL tear and it's going to be the exact same thing. Same foot placement, you guys, same knee loading and things like that. One of you guys posted a video, right, where someone was training on the inside yeah. or was it that same yeah, kid? Yeah, they cue it. They actually yeah. cue it. I don't know it. was that same kid. But yeah, I did. The, I had him. It was him, man. Yeah, right? it was him. I, I oh, did the it? side by side. I took the video. Yeah, he trained on the inside of the his The training yeah, well, works. It like, works. listen, the training works. Like, yeah. you, you put him it. in that position, he went towards ACL in that position. <laughs> it's but, Alabama they just kid. don't respect mm. the injury is the problem. And you can, we try to get this across to the, the basketball world, <laughs> soccer world, um, QB world, O-line world, wide receiver world, DB, the, everybody that's in that field working on their cuts, working on their angles. You know you have efficient ways to turn on a soccer field. Yeah. Wide receivers have the same thing. They have efficient ways to run routes. DBs have efficient ways to cover them. O-linemen have efficient ways to block. QBs have efficient ways to throw. We know that we're narrowing down like what works best. But the problem is, is that you're getting into some of these drills where there, that drill, those cuts, that side to side could be done like Randy Moss or it could be done like that where it's inside ankle bone low because it's just a step. Mm -hmm. It's just a stride. It doesn't have to be inside ankle bone low. It could be if you choose to use the foot that way or if you're unaware that you're using the foot that way, but it could also be inside ankle bone high in a bow. Mm -hmm. So just having somebody there that's in the field work world and they're saying, hey, keep your foot straight when yeah. you cut. Land into a bow. Make sure your head gets into the collar. Make sure you stay out of your heels. That would be a way to change a lot of things for the wide receiver. Any field work world is just paying attention to that that decompression setting and just trying to cue it better. Just yeah. and you're not going to get it all at once, but just the fact that you're at least aware of it, it'll make a huge world of a difference for those athletes that have to cut and change they, direction. They train in it the wrong way too. the The problem happens that it's usually more at the top of the route like at the change of direction or, or whatever, because what happens is is a lot of times you could go do that stuff in a controlled environment. There's no DB in front of you. There's nobody like that. You get to control the shake and you get to control all of that. The problem is, is the pattern that gets instilled when you go out there and that becomes the way that you release or the way that you change direction at, at the top of the route is when, because that's not always at your choice. It gets dictated to you. So if you built a pattern of duck foot inside ankle bone low, you could control it on the field. That kid didn't tear his ACL when he made that change of direction that we showed at practice, but Jameis Williams did, right? So when 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 these guys go out to the field, what they should be doing is going to the top of the route, setting a bow in repetition, set the bow, set the bow, then back it up two steps. Take two steps, set a bow. Take two steps, set a bow. So that at that change of direction, at that moment of change, all the nervous system knows is to set a bow. So when I get put in a position where it's dictated to me what I got to do, if the only thing I've been doing is, is inside ankle bone high setting a bow, then I could stay safe like that. Then you could go and you could try to add the wiggle stuff and all of that stuff to it. But your athlete is now inside ankle bone high. You got to respect that before you could get some Somebody to make a change of direction like Randy Moss does. Mm -hmm. And that's where they get lost. But what happens is, is it gets 100,000 views or it gets 100,000 mm -hmm. likes. It gets the fire emojis and all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And to be honest with you, not like them dudes could sit there and say what they want, but they lying. They don't work with them dudes. They train them once or twice and they're gone. You know why I know that? Because that's what I do. I train these guys. They'll come in they once or twice and they're gone. They, now, some of them, like a Dre Sisko, the defensive back from the Jaguars, he's been doing a real good job of staying plugged in. Matter of fact, he hit me up this morning. He's like, Coach, I expired. I, I need to be renewed. And he went on there and he renewed his membership or whatever. But, like, they, we got the website set up where they don't have to be with us. We got the app set up where they don't have to be with us. So even if they want to go work with one of those field guys, now they have an education because when we brought them in and evaled them, we did like we did with that kid to where they could go work with the guy that's uneducated on human movement and all he's seeing is some hype stuff and they could go do those things and add it into 
their training curriculum, but they could do it with a straighter foot, an inside ankle bone that's high, and they could still. But it's like, but when you talk to those guys, nah, bro, you don't you don't know what you're talking about or this and that, and, and it's like, all right, I ain't even gonna talk to you. But I'm gonna <laughs> use your example whenever your guy blows his knee out. Mm. You know, uh, I'm I'm curious about this because we were actually talked in the gym about this the other day, and I I don't think I talked to you about this, but you know we had Ben Patrick on the podcast, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of basketball players do a lot of ATG stuff, mm -hmm. right? They find themselves getting stronger, they find their knee pain going away, they um, they find that they are feeling better and stronger when mm -hmm. they go back onto the court. So so obviously they're yielding a result in. Uh, becoming potentially more resilient. And my question to you is where is it that you see the holes? Because in terms of his system, there is no spinal loading. There are no big back squats. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if anything, a lot of stuff is body weight. A lot of stuff is repped out. Then there are some things where you can add load to, but he's very, very careful about the way people are suggested to load. Mm -hmm. um, typically it's like form has to be <clears throat> perfect. There's a certain percentage of body weight, but it's like, it's never stressed to go heavier than this. And that's where I can, you know, we had that talk about intensity earlier where the typical thing when you see a lot of some strength coaches when they work with athletes is like, you're gonna get bigger, stronger, you load more over time. There's this idea of progressive overload, mm -hmm. overload, overload. Mm -hmm. But within his system, there's deep range of motion, there's loading based off percentages of your body weight. And it's like, if, if there, there's a big focus on form with a lot of these movements. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious when you see some of those movements, like, you know, we talked about the deep angle mm -hmm. of the knee and the ATG split squat. Why are some of those things in your mind potentially problematic or with the way it's structured, right? Where it's smart in the loading and smart in the way mm -hmm. the athlete uses the weights. Could that be of benefit or does it get in the way of the pattern that you guys are talking about and trying to set? That's pro that's the root of it is that it's not inside the pattern. So <clears throat> if you're looking at that that from a side view, you're going to see front chain dominance talking about kind of jamming the knee over the toe. Mm -hmm. And then if you're looking at it from a front on, you're not going to see that bow set. So it's kind of the same problem that we saw with, with the Cal Dietz example with the squat where there's probably some things that are good. The idea of like, hey, the system should be able to sort of Comp uh, not compress isn't the right word, but sort of fold up into this nice squat where you can close the knee joint all the mm -hmm. way and you could get into this deep expression of what would look like a squat. Yeah. So there's some, there's some truth to that. But when you kind of circle the camera around the movement and you look deeper at the pattern, it's not inside the bow. It's not inside the back chain dominant decompressed structure. And then the other side of it is that there's something to be said about when you have a bunch of knee pain, right, and now you start to flood a lot of blood to that area, yeah. you are going to bring down the pain. Mm -hmm. So you're going to feel like, dude, I did these backward sled pushes and I did all this stuff in my quads and the knee was just pump. It had a huge pump. I know he tries to get the pump into that area. Well, when you get the pump into that area, the pain goes away. Uh -huh. But it's something you're going to have to keep coming back to. Where Goda would differ is that you're going to become Goda. You're going to change pattern such that it just is who you are. Mm -hmm. And your whole, the point of the recode is to not have to recode. Yeah. The point of the recode is to look down at your feet in the line at target and be like, oh shit, it's getting there. It's starting to be Goda. It's starting to be more and more Goda as I go and I change that pattern to where it, it's not going to be a band-aid for you. It's mm -hmm. going to be something that changes who you are. And so it starts first with the pattern. And I think the other thing that that is or people are having success with is that they're flooding the blood to the area that is hurt. And when you do that, you're going to bring down the pain receptors. So they get a response that, dude, I need to, I got to keep doing this. It feels good, but it's still not going to be enough <clears throat> to put you in that pattern of security, which is ultimately what you want to be defaulting to. Mm -hmm. You want to tap into the concept that there is an OS here. There is an operating system. There are factory settings. There are default settings that we want to get to. If we can get to that where it's subconscious and it just is, that's the money because that's going to be me whether I wake up in the middle of the night to take a piss and I got to fly around, someone breaks into the house, or I have a warm up and I got a four quarter game coming up. It don't matter. Like you should yeah. just be Goda. You should be in that state of decompression. The it should be who you are. That becomes the difference between a, a Ben Patrick and what they're doing and what we're doing at Goda is we're not going to compromise the pattern and we're not going to compromise it based off of what we observed so you know mostly and, everything has to, for you guys everything has to be specific to the pattern and if it's right. not um 
I mean, obviously we've talked about the dosage earlier, but even ir ir with that being irrelevant, if yeah. it's not specific to the pattern, you just don't do it if you're a sport athlete. Yeah, right. and we got we got rid of things that, like the patterns never changed. Like what Gilly observed at the beginning, mm -hmm. way back when, that's never changed because he didn't make it up. He just observed people <clears throat> doing it. How we've sort of put a system around that pattern to to spoon feed it or get it into nervous systems, that's changed. Like if you look at the Gota book, there's a shit ton of water workouts yeah. in there. And we had to be like, dude, get that thing it off changed. the shelves, right? Mm. It changed because the more we looked at stuff, we were trying, when I first showed up, they were deadlifting. And the more I looked at it, I'm like, Gary, you can't deadlift. I'm like, well, why? I'm like, well, just look, it's not the behavior. You know, it's not the way it's supposed to go. And then recently we looked at the bolt calf raise and we're like, you can't do calf raises like that. Like you would never be heel in the bow. Ever, yeah. I never want to teach my heel to go down. So even inside our own system, we've looked at it even further. And RJ is probably, he's the brightest of, of anybody in the, in, the, in the whole thing. And he's looked at it at a whole nother level. And he's even looked at stuff and be like, you can't do that. You can't do that. And we just keep modifying sort of what we're looking at based off of the responses that you're getting from people, the the history of, you know, people going through the system and kind of looking at certain exercises and, and, and how they're reacting to certain cues. And well, we got to say this now, why? Well, because people's big toes are popping up yeah. when they try to set the bow. That's something we got to emphasize. Or we look at a bolt calf raise and we go, wait a second, the heel should never be dropped. We shouldn't be putting that in the nervous system. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not that big of a problem overall, because there's so much more that's keeping the heel up, it doesn't jive with what we're talking about. Same thing would be said for a deadlift. Yeah. So the pattern has been number one because that's really all the system was set up around mm -hmm. was something that Gilly observed in the natural world. And his question was, how does the body travel through space for a lifetime and never get hurt for no apparent reason? It's obvious that the walk is something that should be used thousands and thousands of reps throughout the day. That compounded over a lifetime this thing's built for longevity. You can't argue that. It can't fall apart at age 50. That hip isn't meant to blow up and die at age 50. It's got a whole nother 50 years. It should still be good to go. So what's going on, right? So there's something inherently wrong with our patterns. That's why we've placed that at the top. And we've sort of made a, a model of like, you know, the best ability is availability, right? Don't get hurt, security type model. P play off of that because the most efficient version of you right? The path of least resistance equals the most force. So you're, you're at the most efficient state when you're at GOTA. That's when you're in this sort of flow state from a musculoskeletal system standpoint, where you're going to find the ease and the effortlessness inside your movement, the more GOTA you are. The more WOTA you are, you're going to need more recovery. You're going to need more muscle, you know, sort mm -hmm. of like, you're going to have to like bully your way through, whereas you can just be flowing and kind of inside this space of where you feel effortlessness and you feel secure and you feel decompressed because you're goda so we want to get people back to that as opposed to just working out to work out yeah that's where it differs now we can still have that workout and gary does a tremendous job of creating workouts to feel like that same sort of like i walked into the gym i'm here for something there's a rush I'm here for. There's something I want to get out of this to make me feel better. And I'm going to get that same experience. I'm just training a pattern that's more secure. That's the big difference. If, if you look at um, the, the, what we said a little bit about, talked about a little bit yesterday, was the elder side of, of the GOTA, like what we observed at the, at the pin relays and the uh, Ida Keelings. Mm -hmm. and we, we had Hawkins even and Yeah, we showed them or whatever. Um, when we say go back to nature – we know that the Karubo tribe is unscathed by Western civilization. Like uh, the way that they move at 80 and 90 years old is similar to that of a Michael Jordan would have that or Ed Reed would possess that pattern sometimes or young Usain Bolt or something like that. When we say we went back and observed and we looked at nature, I, I and listen, there's people that their verticals are going up doing these over toes, they doing, they're getting better mm -hmm. because they are getting out of pain a little bit. But I'm not going to take the word of Division three college basketball player as opposed to what is natural and what nature's telling me at the unscathed level at 80 and 90 years old. If they're still able to run around and hunt, I'm going to trust that more than I'm going to trust someone that comes from Western civilization. You, you know what I'm saying? And I don't know Ben, and I am not would never say he's a bad guy or nothing like that, and I think he is helping people with his pro. He's given somebody something they might have not had before. You, you know, I, I listened to him a little bit on a 
on the podcast and it's a great guy. But when I need to get down to protecting my athletes and my kids and things like that and the people that come to me, I'm not even going to trust my instinct. I'm going to trust what was right that was either God created or whatever you want to call it, but it could produce at the highest level. They could go run and hunt. and I mean, them guys got to run a half marathon sometime to eat. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? So it, it's like I'm going to trust that. I'm not going to take someone else's word for it because everything that man creates, it, it screws something else up. I would be careful, though, because, well, yeah, he was a D3 basketball player, but he has been able to take his – his performance and his ability to move to somewhat of an elite level. And along with that, there are a lot of athletes that he's worked with who have attained a lot of benefit. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys would probably say, oh, it's because they're moving into ranges and getting blood into places they don't And he can still do. dunk a basketball like a motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah it don't but, mean he's not a talented dude or I, anything. Yeah. yeah. I, I know. But one thing that I, I uh, you know, there's so many habits that we have where like, sitting the way we walk etc that do take us back and then when you have all these bad habits and then you try to add sport on top of those bad habits and then a barbell on your back on top of yeah, that yeah. like you might be good for a while and then you might break but with some of the things that he's doing um i know some of the things do go against the pattern mm -hmm. which i understand that so that's already a, a blocking point of this is not beneficial but the movement ability that people are able to attain um I, I know it would be argued that, okay, that's good movement ability and that's a good ability to move into range, but would you do that on a field? No, you wouldn't end up going into those, potentially those ranges on a football field, et cetera. Uh, but for individuals who, let's say that they're not specifically a basketball player, or they're not, a, they're not uh, doing a sport where they have to cut side to side really, really fast. Mm -hmm. Like let's think general population, right? Or even strength athletes. That does seem to be, there's a lot of concepts within it that do seem to be very beneficial. And I know how we, we look at our, we look at ancestors and we look at tribes that have been affected by modern Western civilization as, okay, these people are able to get into these squats really well, or these people, the weight, like the, what you call naked and what? Butt naked, barefoot. Butt naked, yeah. barefoot. You look yeah. at the way they walk, they're cornering and yeah. they're, they're doing all that. But a lot of the tools that we have, can actually be used, I believe, to bolster us ahead. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think that all the things that we do in the weight room are specifically going to bring us backwards. They could potentially <clears throat> allow us to be more resilient and become stronger, um, generally. Maybe not on the field, because I know you guys would say that that stuff is not sport specific. An ATG split squat, a Nordic, these are isolation mm -hmm. and not sport specific. But as a general human, being able to get into those ranges comfortably, no pain, um, have strength within those ranges and move well, along with, again, keeping in mind what you guys are talking about in terms of ankle space, doing the correct things with the foot, mm -hmm. I think can add, into, can add and make a more resilient, stronger human being. What do you guys think about well, I mean, that? that's the goal, right? The goal is to be resilient. The goal is to be protected yes. for the long run. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that our resilience as a population ain't even close oh, no. to what we would see in nature. Like, we wouldn't make it. Like, mm -hmm. those guys are at another level than what I think we could even probably rationalize our brains around. So we're kind of always chasing them. Like, we're always yeah. chasing sort of the Maasai and we're chasing the Karubo. And that's the ideal to me. Like they're the superheroes, right? Like they're the, they're the top notch athletes of the world. Mm -hmm. They just don't have a sport that they're layering their, their skill into. Yeah. You know, they're not layering skill into that system. They're skilled hunters. So they're good at that. They're skilled runners. They're skilled distance people because they've been training inside of that sort of modality. But as far as us and what we're doing, we actually don't, it's easier. It should be easier yeah. to be resilient in this modern world. Like you have the comfort built around you. Like, What's the worst you got to do? Like, you know, on a day-to-day -day for a gen pop, some people, the most thing they got to do is go down to the, the mailbox to get the paper or they got to walk around at work. So like, the food. yeah, so like, that's a good thing because like you can get your, you don't need to be the Karubo. Yeah. I'm not saying you're going to go butt naked barefoot and live in the Amazon, mm -hmm. but that would be your ideal. And you would use that as sort of the benchmark. And you would say, man, that is what I'm capable of. Yeah. Holy shit. Like the body's built to live literally butt naked barefoot in the wild with nothing. 
I mean, you, people can't even fathom not having Pop Tarts in the pantry. Like, you know what I mean? Like, could you imagine not having? <laughs> <laughs> could you imagine not having? And Seema didn't grow up with Pop Tarts in the pantry. Then have them. <laughs> no, no. But just imagine <laughs> you saying. wake up and there's no pantry and there's no there's no grocery store and there's no um, there's no refrigerator. Yeah. What do you do? Okay, well we're in trouble. Yeah, like these people, dude, they would eat us up. <laughs> these are the resilient ones. Like these are the dudes. This is the this is the 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 pinnacle. Like butt naked, barefoot, chasing fucking warthogs <laughs> in water, and they're setting bows in corners. So like we are way behind essentially to where they're at, and is that's the, the funny part. I mean, what what I what I would say too is is how did they get by without doctors, physical therapists, and all of these different movement? How did they, how they even made it that far? If we need those things, mm -hmm. you that, understand what I'm saying? That I that's saying. not I, it's not like a shot at Ben Patrick. What I'm saying is is I trust that more then I trust somebody that's going to just unlay some program to mm -hmm. me, no matter how super athletic he is or whatever. I mean, LeBron's the most genetically gifted human on the planet, but I probably wouldn't take movement advice from him. Yeah. Because he's got the soft tissue and injury. The other year. side of it is, like, from where we're standing, our vantage point, like, when people ask us these questions, like you're asking us right now. So, like, we're coming at it whereas, like, we've seen the pattern. We've, we've looked at it. We've observed it a bunch. So people will ask us and we'll feel these questions. I'm like, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's one of those things where I'll tell people, I'm like, well, it's, it's not really a bow. It's not really back chain dominance. So people will ask us, is this Goda? And I got to be honest with them. Mm -hmm. Like, no, it's not because, you know, you're asking. So when people ask, is this Goda? Is this inside the pattern? No, it's really not. And, and that's why I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't recommend it because... I've been through enough modalities and methods and systems and I've tried and tested things that I'm not going to, like Gary said, I'm not going to go against what I've observed and what I've seen. Like I've seen too many ACLs. I've seen too many Achilles to know that I can't have my heel on the ground and I can't have my knee tracking over the front without, I can't do that. I need to set a bow. So like my brain won't let me even like go there. I'm like, no, like it can't be that. It has to be a bow when you land. So when we know that this cycle is innate and it is who you are and the fabric is sewn around this concept of moving forward, to me, it's so, it's disturbingly simple and it's easy to get sort of confused or to see a bunch of different modalities that you want to take part in and do, and they may bring some benefit to you, but from where, what the ideal would be, the ideal would be the tribe, and the ideal would be to be as resilient as that tribesman, although you probably never get to that point, but the fact is that you're tri you're striving to that, you have a blueprint, and since we're a system that has a blueprint, we sort of have this, people will look at it like we have this tone of like, well, that's bad, this is bad, but it's just because of the blueprint that we're working off of. And once we have that blueprint set, when things start to combat that, and they start to go against it, and they, they, they buck up against the binary, well, then we've got to be like, well, no, that's that's inside ankle bone wall. I'm sorry. Like, maybe you have felt some sort of change in that, and maybe that's because of the blood thing. Maybe it is that. Who knows? We'll, we'll have to see 30, 40 years from now what the system looks like when it's all said and done. The same thing could be said for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there's, like, there's probably simple, you could say there's a benefit to the fact that, just the fact that he's having you close your knee. Let's say you're somebody that you have a knee problem. You've never really closed your knee all the way. You start closing your knee, you get some of those clicks and pops out of there and you feel better. So we, there's, there's a lot of things that are surrounding this that are kind of like, well, if you're injured and you're hurt, you're going to heal. That's the other side effect of this is people be like, dude, I did this and this after I tore my knee and I, I, I recovered. Uh, yeah, of course you recovered. The body recovers. That's what it does. The question is, can you stay out of chronic pain in the long run? Can you stay healthy and can you stay away from sort of just not, you know, repetitive stress injury for no reason mm -hmm. in the long run? Whereas yeah. like in a rehab facility, I mean, if somebody's hurt through the door, they're going to walk out feeling better. They were just hurt. Yeah. That could be at Goda. That could be at anywhere. So that's not really a great measuring stick. The measuring stick would be what are the elders doing? Does this work in the long run? And does this eliminate sort of the chronic pain and does it put off the joint replacement in the end. So you, um, I know we don't have years on like specifically that program, but you see people who have been doing it for quite some time mm -hmm. and you see that their chronic pain is mitigated. Mm -hmm. Even myself having Oshkut slaughter in both knees and having issues with like, you know, having issues with my knees over the years doing that stuff. And I don't do it nearly <laughs> as consistently as I, I used to. Right. 
But my knee pain is, and I know this is an N of one, but there are a lot of individuals who are in that same boat where chronic pain is gone. And the, the, what I'm trying to get at here is like, I, uh, again, let's, okay. So sport athletes, gen population, strength mm -hmm. athletes, et cetera, right? These are two different populations who need to focus on two different things. The pattern that you guys were talking <laughs> about is still something that people probably should honor to, to mm -hmm. an extent, right? They have, to. Um, they have to. Now, you can look at a lot of these different movements and let's say it's not a sport athlete because obviously you don't want to bastardize what they do on the field. So let's again talk about people like us, people in the gym who aren't sprinting from and doing the side to side direction, all that type of shit. Um, <coughs> you can add these elements to those movements and not cause massive dysfunction uh, or or any dysfunction you know and, and that's what i'm i think that people could do and still get the benefit of being able to access those ranges because you look at gymnasts right or individuals who have great calisthenic type strength mm -hmm. and they have body control yeah that's something that a lot of people are attracted to like they're For like sure. wow mm -hmm. like i want to be able to do these handstands. I want to be able to do these types of mm -hmm. things and have this type of ability to control my body with these different ranges. And a lot of those individuals tend to also be very resilient individuals into old age, you know? So uh, there, there is, I believe there is something there or there, there has to be something mm -hmm. there um, out of the context, again, of being a field sport, locomotion based athlete mm -hmm. that can help us be resilient and go and go well into old age because I know like it's going to be different from the like the Kalahari and the Maasai. Yeah, they have very different lifestyles. But on this podcast, we talk all about first off changing your habits, mm -hmm. right? So getting out of sitting. Whenever I do work, I'm generally sitting on the ground, walking more, doing all these things that are going to help you become a better human. But there are aspects in the gym that not only can allow you to become a better human, but also like over time, people lose muscle. Sarcopenia is a thing. Yeah. And there right. are aspects, I, I know you guys do resistance trading in Gota. So obviously they're going to be, you'll be able to mitigate that over age if you're specifically a Gota based individual. Mm -hmm. But if you're an individual that does any of these types of programs and you still honor those concepts, you can gain muscle, you can progress, mm -hmm. you can have a good movement and you can age pretty well. Like, I don't think you have to do these movements <clears throat> and like, for infinity to, to right. be able to be out of knee pain. You don't have to, um, but they can definitely be beneficial for allowing you to have access to that, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, yeah. that's just like what I'm and getting at here. I would also say that Ben Patrick, I mean, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure how much stuff you've seen on him or, or seen uh, of him demonstrating stuff, but he's moves really, really well. Mm -hmm. I think he's Gota. I think he. Yeah, like, I've never eval. Like we have just hanging out with him. him. Just but, hanging out with him, seeing him walk around the gym, seeing him squat down, and seeing not, him not, like I'll, do all kinds of stuff. Where I'm like, holy shit! Me and Andrew were like I, I nudging fall. each other. We're like, he's Goda. Look at it. He's Goda. Yeah, I was. It was <laughs> if funny. He's Goda. Little, that's why he's not in pain. Yeah, yeah if it's yeah, not be. because of knees over toes. But no, we were following. What I'm saying up. is, is if you, if you, it, the the key to this whole thing is, is to get you to move an ideal pattern, right? Mm -hmm. So whether you are, no matter what your walk of life is, if you're fat, skinny, tall, 80, 90, 10, 15, a crawling baby, if you're in that pattern and your body's decompressed and you move properly, you will not be in pain unless something catastrophic happens to you like where you get hit or something like that, right? So if if I move that way, then I'm I'm good. I don't have to go pull a sled backwards. I don't have to go do a certain exercise to make me that. Now, if I want to go to the gym to add some kind of strength to my life or something like that, and I maintain that go-to pattern, then I'm going to stay pain-free. So if Ben Patrick's a go-to, which I don't know that because I've never done he, the eval. But if yeah. he is, if he is, then the movement pattern he possesses is what's keeping him pain free, and he could probably go do anything he wants. I would some disagree. People might the, get, some people might yeah. get go to just from uh, sports, right? Like Ed Reed. I don't know if he did, Ed Reed didn't train. He didn't lose it. Well, you in should. Your system. Like we said, you should. Right? You're you get your go to. They already give it to you. Like it's, right, in, right, it's right. in the it's embryo. Yeah, yeah, it's who you are. And sometimes you can lose by, it though. Sometimes by playing a sport and maybe finding like your most effective, maybe you you just were able to keep it. You just never lost it. If you um, can keep this pattern through adolescence, 
you're in a good you're in a good place. Like mm-hmm. if you can keep that through those mm-hmm. formative years, you're in a much better place than let's say somebody that went through high school as a woda. They're going to be a lot, you know, they go through high school as a woda and then they're in their 20s and they're in their 30s and then you wake up to this and it's like you're 35, 40 and you find yourself as a of a, a, a woda. Mm-hmm. It's like, "Oh shit, like there's a lot to undo." Whereas if you were goda, it's going to be a, it's the same thing. It's really hard to decode a goda. And it's really hard to recode a super woda. Like it's kind of the same thing. Like just as much as it's going to be hard to take that go to behavior out of Michael, out of Ed, out of Randy, out of Alan, it's really hard to put the go to back into someone that's found themselves in a full reverse, total crooked foot woda. And so it's kind of looking at well, where are you and how many inputs are needed. And then the other part of it is I'm always hesitant on the Instagram sort of like, you know, the, the, what I can do on mm. Instagram. Cause I'm always basing it off of like, well, the athlete has to answer to a certain schedule when you're like your own person and you can do things when you want, it's easy to keep the volume where you want to keep it at. We're saying these athletes have to be subject to a season that there's dates. They got to show up and play regardless. Whereas on Instagram, you can make your dates. Like you can pick which day you want to dunk and you know, dunking a basketball, like, Okay, like there's a lot of people that will go out there as that's their goal. Yeah, like that's not going to be something that's going to make me go, oh, geez, that's amazing, you know? And so that's where my, it's just maybe because I'm an athlete and I've looked at a lot of shit and I've seen dudes that, you know, they're, they came out the womb ready to play pro ball, like that they're born for it. Um, so like the demands and the rigors of a season is sort of more of an indicator of the longevity thing. And Watch that's where when it takes off right there. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I don't know what you guys think of the way he's like landing and uh this is all just conjecture. We're not trying to put anybody on blast. We're not no, to, and we're not trying to bad mouth. Like no. uh, you asking us the difference. Yeah, we're putting between, you guys yeah, in a heart. Like we're putting what it is. Spot. It's not like like I said, I know he's got a, a probably a wife and a kid and he's yep. a human being and he's listen, him, naughty, even whack. Like he, like all of these people were trying to find a better way, not just to make not not from a business side, but I think the initial reaction to everything is is there's got to be a better way. Mm-hmm. But when it becomes your job, naturally there's a business side to it, right? Mm-hmm. Like that, that people comment on our pages all the time, like, "Oh, y'all just trying to get people to buy something." Well, yeah, yeah, we do have wife and kids and <laughs> fucking tuition and shit like that. Yeah, right. like you go and you go to Walmart and they don't just give you the food, right? <laughs> because somebody's trying yeah. to make money somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but what I'm saying is 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 like the intention is to help we know that we respect that about everybody it's just sometimes we get put in these conversations right now i've total transparency i have had in in more than teens 20s 30s of people that have reached out to me and said hey i've been doing knees over toes and go to I've been doing functional patterns and go to, I've been putting these two things and I feel better than I've ever felt. So it's not, but we saying that the longevity side of it is inside of go to the immediate may be in some of those things. If you are compressed spine and you go do FP, you're probably going to feel better. If you go do whack method, you're probably going to feel better. But the thing is, is am I going to have to pull a sled backwards when I'm 80? Am I going to have to do them things bad when I'm 80? Or can I just walk go to? But, but the question is, why wouldn't you? Like, like th- this is the thing. A lot of the stuff that you're like in go to, some of the stuff you're going to be doing that stuff when you're 80. Because, you know. Yeah, like, no, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah but I'm right. saying, oh, you're going to pull part. a sled backwards when you're 80. If you still feel good and if want to. Yeah, if you still yeah. feel good. But I mean, good, how many should... 80-year-olds are doing are in the gym? The, actually, you know, that's the thing. He has quite a few senior individuals mm-hmm. that are doing that programming and that are that are improving. Like he's mm-hmm. posted about them. Mm-hmm. This, this is what I'm saying. It's like the, the the stuff that we do as far as physical fitness, we're going to be doing it because the gym helps. If if you're doing things the right way, we always talk about that. The gym should not be painful. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't be leaving the gym in more pain Agreed. than yes. when you came in. We all agree on this. Mm-hmm. And also, not, for also 40, 50 years ago, the gym wasn't very popular. It wasn't. So that's why the 80-year-olds aren't there mm-hmm. yet. 
Yeah. Well, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, hopefully, like when I'm eight. Yeah. Hopefully, when we are eighty, yeah. we do have the ability. Like, if we want to just put some weight on a sled and walk backwards, there should be no reason. I know what you're saying. Though. We if can. you move well, then you then you, you don't have to worry about. There's it. this. Don't have to worry about. There's this natural. Okay. Okay. There's a natural guilt that we have because of the world we live in where we don't have to get up like we've been saying and go hunt yeah so you're not subject to all the movement that would be there for you if you were truly in the indigenous culture so we need a gym so now you have this <laughs> thing you create this thing called a gym because you need to go there and you feel like you need to get something out you need to yep. get this cardio out you need to get this <laughs> pump in you need to do something because you're like dude i can't just sit in this chair it's anxiety all day. Bro. i can't just sit here i can't sit in this box i gotta go run around i gotta go do something that's mm -hmm. because you come from hundreds of thousands of years of just eight hour hunts and resting on the ground and you're in the wild and your nervous system's tuned up. So yeah. you, sh what we're saying is you shouldn't have to feel like you need to go work out because you're inside that GOTA framework. But if you're a GOTA, more likely than not, you're gonna be in something that's gonna let you express yourself. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that thing, once again, like we talked about earlier, their sport is the gym, mm -hmm. right? I mm -hmm. get that. Yeah. There's other people, their sport is pickleball or yeah. it's bocce or yeah. they want to go play tennis or they want to golf or they want to play, you know, intramural football, basketball, whatever it may be, that's their thing. We're saying that whatever arena you want to find yourself in and you want to walk into, you're better off being a go to walk in, in there than a woda. And yeah, that's yeah. why the sense of urgency talk comes back in. Okay, well, once you find yourself sitting at woda and you're staring in the mirror and it's woda, we would argue that your first priority should be getting back to Gota, should be making that pattern change so that those ball and sockets and that foot pivot point and everything's working the way that it should mm -hmm. so that whatever it is that you enjoy, you could keep doing it mm -hmm. for the long run. Shit, if you like pulling sleds backwards and that's your them. thing, then yeah. I guess go ahead. Let, you know, that's your this, thing. Too. I mean, it could be the deadlift. It could be a lot of different things that you like to do. It could yeah. be backflips. Mm -hmm. It could yep. be pull-ups. There's people that do all sorts of stuff what you've agreed on was the locomotive athlete should be trained in a locomotive lens. Yeah. And that's really what our whole talking point was started on was mm -hmm. these locomotive athletes that their goal is to score touchdowns, to win games, to play the sport at the highest level. They shouldn't be subject to things that aren't speaking back to that pattern. Yeah. That's where that kind of like the whole thing started. And then there is a whole industry created around the gym. And there's a bunch of methods, modalities, and books and things that are being sold. And because we're sitting on the binary side of this and saying it's yin yang, it's yes, no, well, then we're going to always be on the side of like, this is polarizing because mm. you're telling me no. So it's always going to be in a situation where it will look like we're butting heads with the Ben Patrick. But I guarantee if you got him in here and we were talking to him, we'd all be cordial and we'd be friends. Oh, yeah. Because it's just, it's, there's real people behind all this. And at the end of the day, um, people were not those Karubo in a sense that you don't have to get up and go for the eight hour hunt. You can find something that you like inside the gym or something that you feel is challenging you. And it, and it speaks to you on a deeper level than just the musculoskeletal system. Mm -hmm. It helps you socially. Mm -hmm. It helps you emotionally. There's a certain camaraderie of just being in the gym with people and getting out of your damn house and getting in the car and going over somewhere and having to be with other people and the competition of being around other people. So there's a lot of things in the gym setting that kind of go back to that tribe quality of being in a, a, a gathering of people that are like-minded and that are going to push you. So there's always going to be benefits to the gym and we need the gym. And the gym is a place where people can kind of congregate and they can find the best version of themselves. We're just adding a piece to that. We're saying, let me slide this over the table to you. This is the blueprint. Gotcha. Pay homage to this. Yeah. Pay homage to this. Pay attention to this. Don't let this go. Don't throw this off the table because you won't like the long-term effects of it. And that's kind of our, our whole message regarding all these different systems and what's going on in sort of the world we have today. Yeah. One, one of the things I would say is, is I would love to eval him now that we're talking about it because if he moves Gota, then Ed Reed, um, Simone Biles, the 80-year-old Karubo tribesman, Michael Jordan, Ben Patrick, they all move Gota, but only one of them did knees over toes. Well, you know you, what I'm saying? I, I like, get what you're saying. Like, but. so I'm saying that the pattern is the gold standard, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. Like anything outside of that can possibly attribute to it, maybe. Mm -hmm. If it's if we, it's we've done seen right, this with, we've seen it with like Ido Portal, yeah, or like or, or even a knees over toes. Like if you're a Woda and you walk into Ido Portal, you're in trouble. 
Oh, absolutely. If you're a Goda, you might fucking love it. Yeah. I can do all this shit. This is mm -hmm. a blast, dude. Ito's pretty Goda. Mm, so it's yeah. like, it's it just depends on where you're starting. You could be a Woda walking into Ben Patrick and you don't know. Mm -hmm. And maybe you're going a little extra inside ankle bone low and you're like, dude, this isn't for me. Something's wrong here. Whereas yeah. if a Goda goes in and starts doing that, they're going to feel better than a Woda would. There's an aspect that I'm curious about because you, you mentioned Simone Biles and Ido Portel because you look at Ido and then you look at like Roy Goldschmidt and a lot of these individuals. They're, you know, if we're using the term Goda. The way that they move is very Goda, right? Uh, Roy Goldschmidt, if you look up Roy Gold on Instagram, you'll see some of the wild calisthenic gymnastic type stuff that he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but Simone Biles was a gymnast, right? She, I don't know what type of stuff she did in the weight room, but she did do obvious calisthenic type yeah. gymnast work mm -hmm. um, to become one of the greatest. Now, yeah. Michael Jordan didn't do a lot of resistance training. Maybe he did a little bit with, I forgot the author. Grover. Yeah. Grover. He was but already, he yeah. was already Michael. Yeah. Yeah. He's already Michael. But Simone did a lot of these things to strengthen her body mm -hmm. calisthenically. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she touched weights or not, but she did that and she moves in a go to fashion. Mm -hmm. So then it makes you wonder does do it like what what is the thing does doing all those things to strengthen your body because she had to to be able to achieve those feats mm -hmm. as a gymnast is that one of those aspects that leads an individual to be able to you know move in that way along with everything in your lifestyle yeah. Yeah. she is she, at the end of the day she did resistance training with her body right, mm -hmm. right. she did right and she did a lot of things that like probably put her in hip extension with oh, yeah, her body clips all the time the yeah. nature yeah. of the sport but yeah. she moves in that fashion right. so then it, i mean Obviously, she's not a field locomotive athlete, but then, you know, is that an aspect of what allows her to move well? Well, that's what we would say is that this was another, and I was at a party the other day and I was telling people, I'm like, well, you're born Goda. And they're like, well, I didn't know that. I'm like, Shit, I ain't been hitting that point. I'm like, that's a, <laughs> that's a big part of this is like, you already have this. Mm -hmm. You just don't want to lose it. So when someone like Simone Biles and Michael show up and you're just blown away by their movement, what we're trying to say is like, yes, it's because they're Goda and then they're doing those things. Mm. If they were Woda and trying to pull that stuff off, it wouldn't look the same. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, if you can get that, if you can keep the Goda, inside your system yeah. through toddlers, through adolescence, which a Michael did, a Simone did. Obviously, she, we got to see her when she was in that, that teenage uh, phase because mm -hmm. that's when you're doing gymnastics, you're young. Mm -hmm. So you got to see her as a Goda. Now, Michael still got a little decoded. Simone still got a little decoded. She still had a little right side problems with her foot and her ankle and her Achilles complex. Mm -hmm. So even the Goda can be subject to some of the everybody's subject to the environment. But what we're trying to say is that there is an ideal yeah. that is already handed to you. Yeah. And if you could keep this through toddlers, which is why we want to mitigate those weird, you know, walking devices Jumping and devices, little things yeah. that, you know, keep them in the ground, keep them inside ankle bone high, let them crawl for a long time. If you can keep that there and have them be a late crawler, keep their go to through toddler. That's why we always say, if you if we create the floor desk for the schools, you change the world. Mm. Because now mm. you just stay go to through your adolescence. If we could get the kids to where they're at 18, 19 years old, and they've been sitting on the ground oh, yeah. this whole time, they're there. Now it's like, just go play. And then you can do these other things. Cause like I said before, it's an input game. Mm -hmm. So if you're a high level go to, you've seen those straight foot inside ankle bone high, big bows and corners, it's gonna take a lot of woda to pull that go to out of there. Just like if you see a flat foot, crooked, total inside ankle bone, low front chain dominant, shit, I'm a go to coach. I got my work cut out for me. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of things I got to try to fix. It's just going to be so hard to move that nervous system because yes, it's malleable, but it's malleable to a certain extent over a period, meaning it's less and less, mm. right? There's less change that you can make. You can still make change and you should still try to make change, but it's a lot harder to put muscle on when you're older than it is when you're younger. Same thing could be said for patterns. So if we could get this pattern locked into the population and keep it there through adolescence, through easy concepts, like we've been saying, walking, resting, simple sort of hygiene of the, just getting down into the, the ground yeah. and getting back up. If we could keep our athletes there, then you're going to see a decrease in the injuries and you're going to be able to express yourself in all these different, you know, arts. They're becoming arts, essentially. Yeah. They're not necessities to a indigenous or to a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So now they've worked into everything's an art. Throwing a football's an art. You know what I mean? It, it really is. There's a, there's a certain nuance to all those things. And we're saying that hardware, the software should be Goda, 
it, the OS, the default factory setting should be Gota. Mm -hmm. And then whatever skill you want to layer into that system, powerlifting, Olympic lifting, throwing a football, hitting a golf ball, gymnastics, it could be a plethora of things because we have the ability to nowadays go ahead and layer that skill in. Just be aware that there is a pattern. Mm. Be aware that there is an ideal. And I think mm -hmm. that's the main thing that we want to try to help people understand is that it is binary. There is a yes and a no here. There is a right and a wrong. And you, and you don't have to be afraid to admit that there's a right and a wrong. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it liberates you essentially because now you know where to go. And that was always the big thing for me is I'm like, what's the fucking answer, dude? Somebody give me something. I'm trying this. I'm trying that. I sneeze. I blow my back out. <laughs> I'm trying this. I'm trying that. I go to throw the flat route. I throw it in the dirt. Like, what is the fucking answer? Yeah. I'm sick of this. Like, stop wasting my time. Yeah. So when I come at it, I'm always coming at it from a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And so when someone's like, is this, is this good? I'm like, how much time you got in your day? Because, I mean, you got to ask yourself that question. Mm. Now, if you're willing to put three, four hours in the gym and you're a regular dude that wants to work out, sure, I'm sure you got tons of time to pull a sled backwards. But that, that mom or that dad that doesn't give a fuck about working out and they just want to live healthier, I can't sit there and be like, yeah, go do that for health. No, you need to be go to. That's all you need to do is be go to at the baseline. And then whatever it is you want to layer into that, you can talk about that and you can kind of extrapolate from there to a certain extent to where you can let people be themselves and do what they're going to do. And they are, regardless of what we say. Yeah. Our little space that mm -hmm. we're super strict on is like we've already talked about, those locomotive athletes. Those people that have certain goals that are to be a performer on a field, they shouldn't be subject to things that are going to ruin the foot and ankle complex. But we've got to start with something which is, well, what is the foot and ankle complex? What is the ideal there? And once we land that ideal, that's why we always say slide that blueprint across the table, pay homage to this first, and then never lose sight of that macro concept that you are built in an ideal pattern, an ideal design. Always know that as the backbone, the cornerstone of everything you're doing, regardless if you're an Olympic lifter, a gymnast, or you're a high-level NFL athlete, NBA athlete. Just mm -hmm. know that there is a blueprint and that there's something that you want to get towards that is an ideal you guys discovered and uncovered something that's rather, it rather that's than it. Rather no, nothing than it, created rather than, than, yeah rather always than being been like an invention it's and a that's system why, yeah. that you recognize that's why when people will be like oh you guys you you woke me up to this and they'll be like i'm starting to notice it everywhere i'm like it's because it's always been there mm -hmm. we didn't make it up mm -hmm. and that's why <clears throat> you can think about your dad or your mother or your brother or your best friend timmy and you'll see their walk Mm -hmm. You'll see their stance. Like you're already in this world of you're going to mimic behavior. You're going to notice patterns. You just didn't know that there was a right and a wrong. Now that you know there's a right and a wrong, you can better navigate the awareness sort of portion of your day. And that's going to only bode well for you if you're moving towards that go to side of things. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. Oh, sure thing. <laughs> that was a it was a meaty episode Very so meaty. far. Very but meaty. yeah, thank you everybody for checking out today's episode. Hopefully, you guys got a better grasp on what Goda is. Let us know what you guys think down in the comment section below, and uh, subscribe if you guys are not subscribed, and make sure you beat the shit out of that like button for a almost three hour episode. And uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. My Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter is at I am Andrew Z and Simo. Where you at? First off, thank you guys for illuminating all of this and helping me to be able to kind of understand the reasoning behind all you do. It's it's, it's really it's really dope. It's really mm -hmm. dope. Um, and I know that I think I had some assumptions on what it was all about, uh, but you know, seeing how it's based, it's really fucking cool. So I appreciate it. Um, head out to Discord community, guys. Mm -hmm. Discuss this episode. Let us know what the fuck you think. <laughs> um, so the Discord link's in the description. At Nsema Ending on Instagram, YouTube. At Nsema Yin Yang on TikTok in Twitter. Gary and Rick, where they can find? Where can they find you guys and get more info? I'm at GLS underscore Training on Instagram and Twitter. Um, go to Movement.com, Rico225.com. Go to shop, Shop.com. Go to Shop.com. Mm -hmm. Where you get all your products. My IG is at Red Pill Rick. The Twitter is at Professor Goda. I think I changed yeah. it. And uh, yeah, then all the same. What, go to movement.com is the best place um, to check us out. But no, thank you guys. Because this platform, having open-minded people that mm -hmm. are what would seem to be on the opposite side of this thing, you've really allowed us to kind of have this conversation with the lifting world and better explain ourselves. Like we've talked about, you need three hours to kind of yeah. hash out these mm -hmm. things. So once again, thank you guys. And, 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 and we definitely... Um, 
we could agree to disagree with people and we don't mean we hate them. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't like <laughs> yeah. Them. You know what I'm right. saying? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think that's a big confusion in the social media world is like and, and nobody's like, section. I don't like you. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, so. Andrew, can you pull up that, uh, I think I emailed you something. Oh, see, see if you can pull that up. I want you to critique this uh, this run. See what you guys think of this uh, this ostrich run over here. <laughs> oh yeah! <laughs> so this is uh, so just so everybody is aware, like everything we talked about on the show, whether people know it or not, is a giant rabbit hole. And this is about yeah. the spinal engine. And this is a PhD uh, professor kind of breaking down some of the nuances of running. Some people think the hands help propel the feet. Uh, other people think uh, it's more the spine that delivers uh, the force production. And they've done all kinds of weird science on like. <laughs> Uh, measuring people sprinting with their arms tied to their side and like I don't know how much of this stuff you guys know but it's just we I just think this example I, I think just think this uh, shit's, shit's interesting I think that's Dennis Northcott I forget who that receiver is on the left side I'm, I'm butchering I forget his left who. sides man but um bro you got I mean, smoked right by the ostrich it's right fun side. to watch the ostrich run it's yeah. fun to watch the yeah, big cat so it's fun crazy. to watch the animals because yeah. it's still they still got an ankle they still got a hip that that thing you're seeing at the back that's act, that is a long foot so the femurs backwards. tucked up in the in the feathers. That one always messes people up. They think that's the uh, they think that's the, um, the the knee that it's like a backwards knee hinge, but that's actually just a really think it as like a really long tall. Oh, foot. okay. So it looks like he's running backwards. Yeah. That's, no. No. That's not his knee. His uh, knee's actually up near where the feathers are. Oh. Uh, yeah. Man. That'll be in go to. Yeah. Oh, so, so he was saying that foot? the hands don't propel the body, right? Because he had the guy with his arms right here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's what we say. The arms are. Yeah. Are like your, an, your, an amplifier. Right. Yeah, it was like an amplifier, if you will. Yeah, and you guys were talking about the spinal engine, a lot of the force yeah. and stuff mm -hmm. was coming from the spine. Mm -hmm. And think of that spinal, the spine grew legs. Mm. So the, the legs, the, the limb buds, <laughs> even in the embryological, oh, we, we had enough fucking hour. <laughs> 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 I was like, he's really out. going, and, isn't he? <laughs> and, and, all right, here we go, part two. <laughs> Imagine trying to run like that, just with right. your arms straight by right. your side. Just no, you do it. it. We yeah. should like just like oh, sprint. Like, you should do it. Like that. Man, I ain't running no more. <laughs> You did good, coach. The fact that you had Gary I had to go out. I lapped y'all once. That's right. I was like, man, let me just chill out, dude. You know, I, I know. I'm I'm a little overweight. I'm working on it. So listen, He's working in on the it. comment He's section, let me save y'all 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 Twitter fingers. Yeah, I, I know. I, I have some weight to lose. You know, that's all uh, right. Hey, you already dropped like 10 since yeah. last time you were here, yeah, right? Yeah, 15? Yeah, it's going He's down. Working. Dude, it's going down. Then they ain't got shit to say. What hey, we went to 7-Eleven. I don't want to take that I, I grabbed the now solid punch Now you got to really draws. look at my program you if didn't. I lose weight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, what, what they telling me basically is if I'm 225, it's not facts. But if I'm two, 200... Then I'm telling the truth. <laughs> well, I know 25 pounds of truth. Yeah, that's yeah, how social yeah. media works. <laughs> yeah, that's social media. I think media. here's a good rule for you, coach. You need to weigh less than this guy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that yeah. one. <laughs> Because he's like seven feet tall over here. <laughs> saying, huh? I'm, I'm losing yeah. weight. I'm like going to be 170. Yeah, well, my weight's good on somebody that's 6'5". <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's, works my well point. Yeah, that's my right. point. It works there. I'm at Mark Smilly Bell. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. All right. Bye. <laughs>